afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is your host, Chris George Zuger, and you have entered the Den of Lore. Please do grab your glasses of scotch, pull your chair up to the fire, because we're, we are going to learn some really cool shit tonight, courtesy of a very great man and scholar and historian and Egyptologist, David Roll. Uh, we're going to be talking the New Egyptian chronology, which he is uh, quite famous for. And, uh, well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see where the conversation takes us. I, I've been waiting for this episode for quite, quite a while. Uh, ever since I saw uh, Patterns of Evidence uh, Exodus on Netflix, go check it out now. And, wow, um, you know, the, the, the idea of this show, we normally talk about the uh, possibility of lost civilizations and, and pre-dynastic Egypt, Egypt. We haven't necessarily discussed a lot of the old, middle, and new kingdoms, so uh, th this is an opportunity that we couldn't pass up, and uh, 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 David is uh, has been gracious enough to give us his evening. He's several time zones away uh, to discuss with us this uh, afternoon, evening, or morning, depending on where you are all in the world. And uh, as always, thank you very much for all tuning in. Uh, we do love our listeners, and uh, one other thing, I know that there we've had some listeners who have been asking, how is it that I can support the show? Uh, we at Den of Lore actually do have a new Patreon, which you can check out at patreon.com forward slash Den of Lore, if uh, you'd like to be able to contribute to the success, and I, I don't know, maybe see several Den of Lore episodes a week, we'd like to be able to get it to us, uh, so, you know, support and we can get there together. Uh, now, for our opening segment... I wanted to give everybody out there a warm and wonderful update on Mr. John Anthony West. As you know, uh, we have been supporting the John Anthony West project for a number of weeks now uh, in, uh, in supporting uh, Clay Root with his efforts to help support John Anthony West's cancer treatment, uh, whom is currently still in Houston. I know that uh, uh, apparently he had been battling a bout of pneumonia recently uh, while he was there, and from what I understand, he is on the up and up and doing well. Uh, when we last left the Fundly campaign, which you can see at fundly.com forward slash John Anthony West project, or John slash Anthony slash West slash project, or just type in John Anthony West Fundly, or go to John Anthony West's uh, website to see how uh, uh, to see how you can contribute if you can uh, you can also visit denoflore.com forward slash wpp if uh, you'd like to if you don't like to use credit card but you prefer paypal we have a way to uh, contribute to his health fund that goes directly to the uh, west family as well as the fundly um, last week's show, I think we ended up at around 82,000, uh, in the last, uh, week, it's jumped up to $88,611 with 37 days left, uh, in the Fundly campaign. Uh, there are links to the giving levels, uh, and your perks if you do donate in the show notes, uh, in addition to the Fundly campaign does have those on as well. Um, if uh, you'd like a shout out on the Den of Lore, you know, donate uh, $33 uh, during the show, send an email to info at denoflore.com and I will give you a shout out at the end of the show. Uh, now, John, if you are listening, I hope that you are doing well. You're a great man. Your fight is uh, inspiring so many people. I know that Magical Egypt Studios, and you, you can check out um, their initiative at MagicalEgypt.com, uh, they are holding a silent auction, and all proceeds will be going to John Anthony West's uh, uh, cancer fight. Um, I know that the Den of Lore is uh, going to be contributing a signed copy of our John Anthony West Project Telethon show notes by me and Alex, as well as a uh, laminated um, uh, wood-mounted copy signed by us here at the Den of Lore uh, from the campaign. So if uh, you can check that out, and should be up soon. I still have to talk to Venice and finalize the details, but John, we stand with you and your family every single step of the way. Uh, now, uh, most importantly, for why all you ladies and gentlemen are here, uh, Mr. David Roll, he is uh, joining, he's been on the line with me listening to us the entire time, and uh, I'm going to announce him now. Uh, the quick and skinny of it, he doesn't need much of an introduction because he's so well known. He is one of Britain's top Egyptologists and one of the world's top historians. Uh, 
uh, has been known for BBC specials, uh, Fair One Kings, in addition to being a large part uh, of his research being based off of uh, Patterns of Evidence Exodus. Uh, David, how are you doing today? Welcome into the den, and uh, thank you very much for joining us. I'm doing great, Chris. It's nice to be with you. Well, thank you very much. I admit, I love that voice. That is amazing. <laughs> well, I like your voice too, actually. I just noticed the Canadian little twist in the word oat. You don't say it the American way. That's great. I love that. And how, how, how have things been going in Spain? How has the weather been? It's not been great this last few weeks, actually. We've had quite a bit of winter. We've had deep snow for a couple of days, and then we've had lots of rain and storms, and uh, it's been quite dodgy. And then uh, it just started to sort of smile again upon us the last couple of days. The sun's come out, and the, the blue skies are back. But normally, where I am, we get about 20 days of rain a year, and that's about it. But I think we've had those 20 days in the last five days. So we've had a lot of water, a lot of rain, but it's uh, it's good for the ground. It's, it's good for the cherry trees. We have 100 cherry trees in our plot and uh, it's nice for them to get some water and well at least you're not dealing with the the several we had several feet of snow last week and now we're getting no. several feet of rain so you're, well you you're... expect that from where you live but i don't expect it where i live to be honest well i've been to i've been to the area i spent uh, uh two weeks in the algarve last summer uh, yeah. and mm -hmm. it was it was absolutely uh, stunning I, my wife and I agreed that we have to find some way to, um, some, some way to retire or simply just work in Canada from somewhere in the Iberian Peninsula because it's absolutely beautiful there. It is a gorgeous place to live, I must admit. Now, from the accent, I would take a very wild guess and say that you are not from Spain originally. So Co Correct, <laughs> but can you guess what part of the UK I come from, from my accent or not? Um, I'm... I'm... A... I'm no, I, I can't. You know, I, I probably do, but the name is not coming right to me right at the moment. Okay, well, I, I, I was born in Manchester, so that's not very far from Liverpool. So we've got this sort of Lancashire twang to our voice. It's not quite the posh Queen's English that you get down south. Uh, but uh, it's very fashionable to have an accent these days, so I don't bother about it too much. Well, I, I tried it on the show once or twice. It just didn't end up working working out too well. My wife said, Chris, you have to stop doing that. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I like your accent. I think it's great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, now, would you having been born in in England, I know I know that you've you, like you've traveled the world. You have been to Egypt numerous times. Uh, you've been to yeah. the the um, uh, the Fertile Crescent of uh, of the, the Holy Land, in addition to the Middle East. Uh, how how did you get started with archaeology? Because I know that you have quite the history before your your uh, history roots. That's very true. I mean, I started writing Egyptian hieroglyphs when I was uh, probably seven years old. Don't ask me why. I have no idea. But we found a, a large uh, exercise book full of Egyptian hieroglyphs that I'd written before I could even join up the writing properly. Uh, I was writing on the king's lists of the Egyptians in hieroglyphs, in Greek, and also in English, and uh, working all the dynasties out at the age of seven. And I have no idea why that is. It just... just and then I went to Egypt for the first time at the age of nine. That was in 1960. And uh, travelled on King Farouk's paddle steamer all the way from Cairo to Abu Simbel. Uh, King Farouk had just been thrown out of the country a few years earlier with the um, Egyptian revolution. And uh, so he was no longer there. And we commandeered his, uh, what we were equivalent to be a royal yacht, which was still on the Nile, and uh, with its crew. And we, we sailed all the way up the river for virtually 700 miles to Abu Simbel, and that was my first experience of Egypt as a nine-year-old. And uh, since uh, since you did that, you had um, uh, also, again, like you had entered in uh, into uh, Egyptology fairly late within within your life. I know that uh, beforehand. That's true. So, yeah. which, which... It's very true. What happened was I, I was into all this until about the age of 16, I suppose. I was going to Egypt several times, uh, doing all this work. I mean, it's like most kids. They fall in love with ancient Egypt at the age usually of about seven or eight. But uh, I kept going with it until about the age of 16. Then I got involved in the music industry because this was the sort of 60s. And I ended up spending 25 years in the music industry with bands. And then I became a, a recording engineer. And then from there, I became a record producer, working with some uh, quite well-known English UK bands and a few others. And uh, I did that until sort of like I got to the stage where I earned enough money not to have to do it anymore. And I thought to myself, why am I working for three months at a time, working on an album 
for a rock band sitting in the studio for 16 hours a day, blasting my ears, smoking 80 cigarettes a day. It wasn't doing my health any good, so I packed it in. And I used the money from royalties, my production royalties, to finance uh, a return to university. I'd already been to university once before to study photography uh, in my teens. And then I, um, I went back again about the age of 35 and uh, did a, a BA in ancient history and Egyptology with also more courses on Levantine archaeology and Mino Minoan and Mycenaean archaeology. That's strange. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, sorry about that. Uh, everybody, um, uh, internet on both sides. I know that uh, uh, I know that uh, David is currently on top of a mountain and is not using land internet, and I'm using Canadian internet. That's right. So if uh, any of our Canadian yeah. listeners understand, if you've dealt with Rogers or if you're American and have dealt with Comcast, you know what throttling is like. And uh, considering how popular the show is getting, uh, they are not necessarily liking us too much, but still, you guys love us, and that's what's most important. So I do yeah. apologize for that. Uh, you had been discussing your return to um, uh, to college and your degree. That's right. I don't know where it cut out. So I just explained to people that I live on a mountain and my receiver, as it were, from my transmitter is 10 kilometers away. So sometimes it does. We do lose a signal occasionally. So hopefully it won't happen anymore. Yeah, I mean, I when I went to college, uh, University College London, that was uh, at the age of 35, I was um, studying ancient history and Egyptology with Levantine archaeology and Mycenaean and Minoan archaeology, um, Greek archaic history. I was doing the whole gambit of courses. And then when I got my BA, I went on to do an MA and a PhD, uh, and I was awarded a very prestigious um, award or scholarship to do that PhD at the University of London, uh, the WF Mason Scholarship, it was called, History Scholarship. So I, I went on to do the PhD, and it was on a very difficult subject area. It was something called the Chronology of the Third Intermediate Period in Egypt, which is a horrifying title and a horrifying subject. But um, and then I was I gave a lecture um, to the Egypt Exploration Society in London, and in the audience was a, a literary agent, and he came up to me after the lecture and said, um, "Are you represented by anybody?" I said, "No, I mean I'm just a PhD student," and uh, he said, "Well, would you come to my office uh, next week?" And so I trundled along there, and within the space of probably about two months. We'd got a major uh, publishing deal and also a TV series called Farrows and Kings, which was jointly produced uh, by Channel 4 in the UK and Discovery Channel in America. And so in, a, in the end, I was sort of dragged from university kicking and screaming and ended up really as a TV presenter and, uh, and author best-selling author and that's really been where my career has gone ever since I didn't go back to university afterwards because I literally had no time to do so and for Pharaohs and Kings like that was a, a kind of a seminal release I know it was released in, in 1997 and there's a very good chance uh, uh, my mother had uh, had gotten me into that um, all right well she she read uh, anything from like Velikovsky um, Robert von Deniken uh -huh. so that that's where a lot of a lot of the um, alternate side of ancient history came from and trying to be able to search for different opportunities and in, in, in different um, you know d different perspectives as it were sure uh, now the the pharaohs and kings uh, i i've watched uh, a few of them they have never been available here in canada to my knowledge which is unfortunate as far as the shows are concerned how, how was it working on those and what was the process you started to to, to get that going well, it's the usual thing with TV. Um, if you're not known, if you're not a celebrity presenter um, like Michael Wood or John Roma, they were the two main figures in this field in the 1990s. Um, you tend to have to go along with what the producers and directors want you to do. And it's only when you become well established that you can turn the tables on them and say, well, I'm going to do it my way from now on. There's nothing much they can do about it because your fame allows you to dictate to them how you want to do things. So Ferris and Kings is the first project I did for TV. And uh, it was quite a difficult process for me because um, – the producers were always wanting to do things in a certain way that I thought wasn't really the way that my scholarship wanted me to go. They were always trying to make it a confrontational issue between me and other scholars, always trying to, you know, press the angle forward. And also they, they wanted to sort of like keep it simple, not, not put the stuff in that was really important to the, for the evidential point of view. So it was a tough nine months making the three part series. 
But then when it was out and finished, and we had a great director who really did a fantastic job on the editing and the, and the pictures were wonderful for that period. It was a classical BBC-style documentary, widescreen, the whole works, beautiful photography. And, and it, it, it created a huge impact, a massive impact. When it, um, it came out on in the UK uh, in 95, actually, in, this, in the autumn of 95. And they were shown on Sunday evenings uh, for three weeks, consecutive weeks. And uh, after the first showing on the first episode on the Sunday, by the Wednesday of that week, they'd completely sold out of all the books they had. So they cleared 60,000 books in three days in the UK. And that is an astonishing figure for the UK because it's a relatively small country, as you know, not a huge population. And um, so they completely ran out of stock by the time before the second episode was being shown and they had to go and uh, arrange for an emergency printing in Italy and have them all shipped over from Italy by plane in order to catch the audience because <laughs> there was such demand for the books. It was completely crazy. For somebody who just come out of university and was doing a PhD as a student, it was completely overwhelming to walk down, you know, the streets in London and find your book in the front in the front window of the main shops there, the main bookstores and the full displays of your book there. It was just a really weird experience. You know, I can understand that completely. Um, believe it or not, I know that we set this uh, this interview up uh, somewhat last minute. I think it was about uh, a week and a half ago you had agreed to come on the That's show. That's right. <clears throat> True. Yeah. I actually tried to find a, a copy of uh, Exodus uh, Myth or History. And right. not only could I not find one in any of the bookstores, all of my, all of the libraries had them booked out until well at the end of February. <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah, so it's there's it's, a good reason for that. I mean, th th this particular book you talk about now, Exodus Myth or History, was actually published by the the makers of the film Patterns of Evidence, the Exodus. It, they are the publisher of the book. Um, I agreed. It's my contribution to the to the film, as you know. The movie is quite mm -hmm. uh, a lot. I'm, I'm I'm in it quite a bit, and they tend to use my material a lot in the, in the uh, documentary movie. So they wanted to publish the book, and I was quite pleased to do that because they offered me to print it all in full color, and that was the first time that I'd been offered that. I mean, I, I love the production quality of books. I, I really enjoy books, and when I see a book that's in full color with beautiful, fine art paper, lots of illustrations, I like that sort of thing myself. So when they offered me this opportunity to actually publish the book in color, I snapped it up. And so they were the publishers, and uh, and so they haven't actually got it distributed through the book system. They are online. Their patterns of evidence bookstore is where they sell it, and I sell it in the UK on my. Uh, I've got a sort of warehouse full of the books, and they're sold on Amazon UK. So the place to buy it is actually either from Amazon Com or Amazon UK, or directly from the patterns of evidence uh, bookstore or store. So they're those are the only places you can really get it. And for you know, for patterns of evidence, how how did that um, uh, that project come about? Well, it's one of those stories, isn't it? Um, Pharaohs and Kings came out. Everybody saw it in the nineteen late nineteen nineties. Um, some people who were coming up in their careers as film directors and movie makers or, or that sort of thing, producers had seen the film possibly when they're in their teens or early 20s and um, when we came to to the you know the 2000s and into 2012 2013 these people had matured and got their own companies and and Tim who's the director Tim Mahoney is the director of the movie wanted to interview me he'd been trying to get together to make a film about the the route of the exodus I don't know if you can kind of just say route or route but anyway the the direction which the exodus took and where the mountain of God was the mountain they call Sinai in in the book of exodus where it was located um, and so he was trying to do a movie about that and he wanted to interview me and so he arranged to come over when I was living in the UK in Tunbridge Wells to interview me and we spent a whole day being I was interviewed by him, just the two of us there in my library, and uh, it became the sort of the, the concrete form of what the film became afterwards, because what I was talking about to him impressed him so much that he wanted to change the direction of the movie and move away from the journey of the Exodus to whether the, the history of the Exodus was a real thing or a fiction, whether it was fantasy or, or reality, which is basically where, what my, where my work had gone over the previous years. So he changed his direction to accommodate my theory, and that's what Patterns of, Patterns of Evidence became from there on. So it was all about a young director mm. seeing this material and then coming along in, in his maturer years when he's got his company set up to make this independent documentary, which was of such quality that uh, it was decided to release it on the cinema circuit. 
And it was seen by millions of people in America uh, and special showings on one night that they took it all around the country. It was being shown simultaneously. And and from then on, of course, it's uh, it's sold huge amounts of DVDs and uh, it's now going to be made into a 12 part TV series. Uh, so sometime next year it will be on TV at, on some station and it will be an extended version lasting something in the region of six hours. That is absolutely insane. And, you know, I'm definitely going to be catching that when it comes out. Um, I've, I've watched uh, Patterns of Evidence probably about three times at this point. Oh, have you? <clears throat> Excellent. Well, it, for, for, for a two-hour documentary, it's, it, it's it, it quite, some, it quite um, a robust piece of work, as, as I'd like to be able to say. A lot of documentaries yep. will last 45 minutes because they're expecting to put it on let's say discovery or natural geographic and it's only going to be sure. one hour and a lot of that is going to be you know repeated material um which mm. would cut into after commercials whereas this yeah is there's, just... a, there's a there's a yeah exactly there's a tendency in in documentary making to have one idea that just repeating over and over again for 50 minutes or 45 minutes uh the the patterns of evidence uh, program or film, if you like, is is lots and lots of ideas coming together. It's a complex storyline, uh, and it needs to be explained very visually, which the film does. And I, I, you can imagine, if you then take it into a six-hour, uh, thirty-minute, tw- twelve-part series or something like that, you can go into a lot more detail. And that this is the quality of the type of of documentary making I think we're missing now in this modern world of ours. It used to be made in the 1990s, 1980s and 90s with Roma and, and Michael Wood, but now that when you look at most most of these documentaries on TV, they're rather shallow. They've not really got the depth and quality that they used to have in the old days. So um, I'm, you know, it'd be great if we could bring that back again, I think. Well, it's one of the reasons why a lot of people get into, let's say, Magical Egypt and, and have supported that uh, that particular yeah. work from John Anthony West. And I know that's, yeah. a, that's a plug to uh, the, the new series John, that is coming out, um, uh, Magical Egypt 2, in the next little while as well. Um, right. And there, the, the style of of um, doing those types of long series, whether it's a, you know, one, it's in a one hour series, but it's one particular idea for that as, as a um, uh, kind of like a uh, essay piece, like a, a, a thesis. So they, right. they list the one thesis and they, they go through the entire, the entire information uh, list on how, to, on how to be able to prove that. Whereas in, you know, let's say from shows like ancient aliens, which I, you know, is, is entertaining as a show, but, it, it's a lot of suppositions to 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 get to that one point, and a lot of leaps of of um, of uh, what, what's the term here that I'm looking for? It's the, it's the old phrase. Yeah. Could it be that which is repeated <clears throat> about thirty times in the Ancient Aliens program? Precisely. Could it be that X? Could it be that Y? It's always that. Uh, it's always questions, not facts, and that's half the problem with it. Well, in, in, asking questions isn't necessarily a bad thing because it, no. You know, but at the same time, when it's uh, using questions to have a leap of uh, logic, as it were, towards a certain answer, uh, yeah. Th- yeah. you know that that's where you can kind of lead into a. Um, I'd say not necessarily darker path, but more of a uh, misinformation path. And uh, I'm not saying one way or another whether they do that, because I, I think that, uh, you know, Giorgio is a, is a great, fantastic guy, and so is the rest of the cast. Um, and we, we've had some of the, the people who've appeared on the show on this show as well. Sure. But, uh, you know, for, for me, it, it's a matter, and especially with this show, it's a matter, it, it, the purpose of the show is to try and get to the truth, or at least try and dig up as much information towards getting to the truth. And, and towards that end, having you on is, you know, another cornerstone that we have to to, to dig into that information. And, uh, you know, I, I recently watched your, your series on, or not the series, rather, but uh, the documentary on Finding the Garden of Eden. And All right. And I thought that that was absolutely fantastic with regards to trying to find the location and using comparative um, uh, linguistics to say, okay, well, this river is supposed to be named this in this time yeah. based on the way that it was shown. And it reminded me a lot of Laird Scranton's work where he compares, let's say, work from the uh, the uh, language of the Dogon to um, Old Egyptian mm-hmm. to try and find a comparative um, uh, you know, base to to try and grow the the idea of, of where this culture came from. <clears throat> so how how did you get the idea for um, the, uh, the 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 Eden story? Well, it 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 was a, it was an official progression on from doing uh, Pharaohs and Kings. Pharaohs and Kings was the name of the book in the states, but in in the UK it was called A Test of Time, and it dealt with the historical period of Egyptian history and what we would call the Old Testament. 
the thing I didn't go into in that particular book was the stories in the book of Genesis, which comes obviously before the historical part or the so-called historical part of the Bible. And uh, the Genesis narratives are very mysterious. I mean, they're a collection of stories that are almost fantastical in many respects, and including these astonishing ages that some of these patriarchs have, you know, 900 years old for the Methuselah, etc. And so people th regard them as fairy stories, and it's understandable why they do that. But they probably derive from a series of legends that come out of uh, ancient Mesopotamia, particularly collated together by, in the time of Hammurabi, the king of, king of Babylon 1, the first dynasty of Babylon, who had a great library and he brought together all these ancient traditions and put them onto tablets and they were then dispersed around the civilized world so people could, who were literate could read those stories. And some of them must have got to Egypt, of course, and places like that. So uh, they have origins in these foundational legends of Mesopotamia and I thought to myself well these Genesis stories seem to be derived from that material and although we would we don't necessarily believe that an Adam and Eve were the first human beings on the planet etc etc uh, but there must have been an origin of these people who lived in Mesopotamia where they had originated from what their legendary stories were and the geography of those stories and the first thing you notice in the in the story of Genesis I think it's in chapter 2 is there is actually a location for the Garden of Eden and the land of Eden. It's actually given there in cold, hard, black and white. It's no, There's no fantasy in it. There's no miracle, miraculous explanations. It's just simply the place where four rivers had their headwaters, and that's where Eden was. And uh, two of those rivers are very well known. One was the Euphrates, the other was the Tigris. And we thought, well, we know where their sources are. We know where their, those rivers begin. So if we just simply trace our way back to the, the sources of the Euphrates and Tigris, we'll be in the land of Eden, which is what I did. I went and got into a four-wheel drive vehicle and in southern Iran, uh, along in the Mesopotamian plain there. Part of Iran is in the actual Mesopotamian plain. And we drove up through the Zagros Mountains, all the way up through the seven gates of so-called paradise, uh, which are mountain passes, and ended up in the land of Eden. And everything that's described in the book of Genesis of Eden is there in the topography of the landscape. And it was just very obvious once, once you got there. And then we began to realize that this was the very place that um, human civilization began, where the first pottery was made, where the first uh, wine was made, the first viniculture was there, the first growing of grain crops, the first domestication of animals, all those things occurred in that region. And so the Genesis story is telling you about the, the rise of civilization out of hunter-gatherer society into sedentary farming communities and, and herding communities, pastoralists, and that is the story of Cain and Abel and the, the farmer versus the, the pastoralist or the shepherd and the conflict between those two individuals, which is actually a conflict of civilizations between city dwellers and farmers, sedentary folk, and pastoralists who wander through the landscape. That's been the perennial uh, problem in that region of conflict between pastoralists and agriculturists for the past like 20,000 years. So, uh, you know, that's that's where it all began. And that's where the Genesis story was molded in that area. Now, what do you think your opinion is? Uh, or I should say, what is your opinion? And how do you think of the Genesis story being uh, kind of not necessarily rehashed, but retold and carried forward through so many faiths through the through the centuries. Uh, from my understanding, uh, you know, Sumerian culture can be traced back up to 4000 BC or 6000 years ago or, or older. And yeah, older slightly, yes, so, a little bit older. So mm -hmm. the, 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 the history is... Uh, you know, like the very, very similar stories have been told throughout, whether it's the, the Genesis story, the, the story of Noah, or, you know, let's say the Exodus there, there have been uh, some similarities between them. Um, although from the Exodus standpoint, I, I can understand that in that part of the world, in that day and age, a similar story with so many people moving around probably could have been told more often than not, um, just based on the, the, the way civilization worked at that time. Now, how, yep. I, I know that you've, you've discussed uh, anachronisms quite often in your work. Uh, how, yep. how have the anachronisms um, shifted between the old stories from Samaria to uh, the new stories that have been, or the newer stories that came out in, let's say, the Torah or the Old Testament and, and the New Testament? Well, I'm of the view that there is a, a key to this whole business, and that is the fact that the so-called authorship of the book of Genesis, the so-called authorship of the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, is attributed to Moses. 
the, the Prince of Egypt, mm -hmm. who was undoubtedly an educated man. There's no doubt about that. Although the story of him being plucked out of the river by the princess, we don't know whether that's true or not. It seems pretty clear that if a Moses character did exist, that he was literate that he was educated within the palace system in Egypt. And therefore, he would have had access to the literature we've just been talking about, the, the tablets from Hammurabi's uh, library um, in Babylon 1. That's the era when my new chronology puts Moses in that particular time period. And so he would have known these, this material by reading it or been even been told about it by his tutors. So when he then is thrown out of Egypt and goes into exile and then comes back later, to to give his slave population people his his um his kindred spirits there his brethren their foundational stories he has to create a, a nation out of these bunch of slaves who've lost all knowledge and understanding of their past it, because they've been into slavery for you know quite some time and so what he gives them is the knowledge that he's read and accumulated from his time as a prince of Egypt, a learning about Mesopotamia, about the ancient legends, and he molds it into a story that we call Genesis, Bereshit in the, in the Hebrew. Mm -hmm. uh, and that gives these people their foundation, their, their something to be, that, that grows into nationhood. Without that, if they have no origins, they don't have a nation. And that's Moses' great skill is to turn this bunch of Hebrews, this bunch of Israelites living in slavery in Egypt, into a nation. And he does that by giving them a past. That's what he does. So there's a mechanism there that explains how it gets into the into the Torah, into the into the Old Testament. But the legends themselves were disparate legends on different tablets recorded in the time of Babylon one. And they would and some of them go back much earlier into the time of Sumer, the very beginnings of, of Mesopotamian civilization. So it's it's twofold process. First of all, Hammurabi collects together all this material that's been going been written for several thousand years and he brings it all together and he puts it in one place like a publisher and then that other people have access to it like Moses and he then gives that to his people to create a foundational story for the Israelites. Now the interesting thing that I've I've seen and I, I know with with the chronology being uh, different from uh, some others that are out there and I know that there's a lot of uh, a lot of theories there's more theories in Egypt than there are grains of sands in Egypt as as, they, as uh, one Absolutely. person said to me yeah. true and yeah. uh, I know that uh, a good friend of mine uh, in front of the show Scotty Roberts Scotty how you doing I know you know if, if you're doing it at home fantastic I said I'd give you a shout out and I hope you're doing well um, now Scotty Roberts once wrapped my hands on air because I had a question not necessarily wrapped but um, corrected me when I had mentioned the um, Akhenaten is Moses theory. Oh and, dear, yes, right. <laughs> and, do, you want, do you want to put your hand out now, and I'll give you the slap for you? It, it's it, it's kind of, kind of a, a, um, a tradition on the show that I will get corrected at least once, so I'm just putting that out okay. there to get it out of the way. So if you'd like to right, at least right. correct that before we go any forward, that before we go any further, that would be much appreciated. Yeah, it's it's an old it's an old story, and it, and it's an obvious one, isn't it? That you've got a You've got the first monotheist in history, so-called, Akhenaten in Egypt. And then you've got the first monotheist in the Bible, which is Moses. So you're bound to want to stick the two of them together. But, I mean, that's not really a basis for, for actually making them contemporary. And uh, historically speaking, they don't match in any way, shape or form. Akhenaten's a king. Akhenaten builds a city. He's a, is a ruler. Moses was never a king. He was, I know, so you can't really equate the two. The, it's this whole sort of story of the idea that um, his grandparents were uh, Hebrews and, and Yuya and Toya we're talking about now. Uh, and that Yuya was uh, um, Joseph and all that stuff. None of it fits together at all. A, it's the wrong time period. B, the figures themselves, the historical figures don't match. C, um, Akhenaten's got a tomb in Egypt. Moses was buried on Mount Nebo in, in Jordan. None of the stories really fit together. If they do, they're on a very superficial level. So that's poor history for me. That doesn't, that's not history which melts together and joins together in a way that's satisfactory. And it's just a rather simplistic idea that's been latched upon by you have two monotheists. Let's, let's make them the same person. Uh, it's much more interesting to place 
Akhenaten and his religion, his his faith, into a different era. And if you put him into the time of the Davidic period, the time of David in in history uh, in the Bible, then you do see parallels between Davidic forms of monotheism, the Yahwehism, and also what we see in Akhenaten. For instance, Psalm 104, supposedly written by David, is a dead ringer for the hymn to the sun written by Akhenaten. They're almost identical in terms of the imagery they both create. The fact that solar worship in the terms of Akhenaten is to do with the light of the sun. And in the David period, Yahweh is the light. He's the light lighting up the Holy of Holies. He's the light of, of knowledge and understanding and, and wisdom. And so they are, there are parallels between those concepts, the philosophical uh, concepts. Nothing to do with mosaic Yahwism. It's a very different uh, model entirely. So Akhenaten fits much better into the Davidic period than he does into the Mosaic period. Okay, well, thank you very much for clearing that up. I, and th this is the second time where I've had that confirmed. So, unfortunately, listeners, if you're expecting an Akhenaten is Moses th uh, show at some point, you're probably not going to get it. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just invite Ahmed Osman on; he'll do that for you. Oh well, you know, it's it's a possibility. It might be entertaining, but from from a from a truth standpoint, we uh, we, we have a fairly high uh, level of of uh, searching for truth, as it were, and it's, you know, part, part of my um, uh, Masonic uh, kind of leanings, as it were, to to try and at least find light. And that, that's kind of a theory that I've found is, is prevalent within most uh, most um, faiths or most um, uh, followings, as it were, of this. this just, re just, remember, just remember that truth is relative. Truth has always been relative. <clears throat> True enough. It's, uh, you know, you, it's uh, your side, my side, and the truth, as it were. So even that, even your side or my side might ne not necessarily be what is, but at the same time trying to be able to, to, to discuss between two individuals, whether it is a scholar yeah. and a radio host or two mm -hmm. Egyptologists out in the field, um, the, the idea is to try and, and get that dialogue going so the continuation of that knowledge and that expansion of that knowledge can, mm -hmm. can be achieved. And That's true. With, yeah. Well, History is the thing, isn't it? If, if, if we're talking about historical truth rather than natural truth, historical truth is all about interpretation. I mean, the facts are the archaeology in the ground, the texts and the ancient uh, documents and, and the monuments and the, and the ruins and the, and the bones of the people who died in the past. The past is what happened. History is only really our best best guess at what happened. And how you decide what's a good history and what's a bad history is when you eliminate as many of the anomalies that occur in the development of your history. If you have a history full of anomalies that don't seem to fit properly, then that's not a good history. If you have a history that you've really gone into good detail and you've found as many matches as possible and you've got eliminated most of the anomalies, then that's a better history. So if you look at history books written 150 years ago, they're full of holes. They've got problems. And then you get into more, more to contemporary times like now, you tend to have eliminated many of those anomalies and therefore you get better history. So the old adage is if you're sitting in your tutor's uh, library office at university and on one side you have a whole row of books on archaeology and on the other side you have a whole row of books of history, the books that are valuable to you are the ones, the archaeology books, not the history books, because the history books change every 20 or 30 years people write new history books and they're different to the ones that were from their previous generations now uh, i know that with uh, uh, michael w who's joining us in, in youtube chat hey michael how are you doing thanks for listening uh he's asking uh, regarding the uh, how uh, the imagery of moses and how it's changed uh it mm -hmm. over the time now cer certain people may have have uh, represented it as him being the devil or lucifer um, but mm. the, or they've interpreted it that way, but what, what is the source of that? Um, what is the source of that, that imagery? I'm not sure whether I've even heard of it. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, Moses, the figure that you hear about in the Bible, which is the only place we have a source for him. I mean, where else do we find material on Moses paints him as a, as a figure who, first of all, is extremely fortunate to be introduced into the royal family of Egypt. Uh, he commits a murder, so he's a murderer. When he, he beats the, uh, the, the Egyptian um, supervisor over the head and has to flee away into Sinai or wherever he is in the wilderness that he goes to, and he comes back a reformed man, 
And then he's this remarkable figure who is a charismatic figure is able to take these slaves out of Egypt and take them to their so-called promised land, even though he's not particularly articulate. Apparently, he has to get his brother to uh, speak to the people because uh, he's slow of speech, whatever that means. Um, so I don't I've not heard anybody say or I've not seen any writing to say that he's equated with a sort of Beelzebub demonic figure as far as I'm aware where does that come from what literature does that come from uh, apparently it, it's on uh, it's on Google and I'm trying to find a uh, image of it so I can show it but I'm not I'm not uh, I'm... oh I know what we're talking about now we're <clears throat> talking about the Leonardo statue aren't we in Rome with the two horns coming out of the top of his head is that what we're talking about must be I possibly I yes. guess yeah, there's a marble statue, one of the churches in Rome of Moses. It's a wonderful, beautiful statue, and he does have two horns growing out of the top of his head. I, I, did remember, I do remember reading about that once and what it's supposed to represent, but it's gone completely out of my mind now what it is. But I don't think it's anything to do with demonism, as far as I understand, any more than saying, for instance, that the Zulkarnain in the Quran is supposed to be Alexander the Great. Uh, he's got two horns simply because he wore the... The, the helmet with ram's horns of Zeus Ammon, because when he went to Egypt to see what oasis, he was declared the son of Zeus Ammon. And Ammon, of course, is the ram-headed Egyptian god. So on the coins of Alexander you find in Arabia, in Persia, he's got horns on the side of his head. And and he and becomes in the Quran the Zulkarnain, which means the two-horned one. So, you know, whether or not you can say just because somebody's got horns on the head, it means they're a demonic person. It's another matter. I don't think that's the case. Well, keep in mind, I'm also, a, I, I'm a 32nd degree Freemason and to our listeners, I'm the yep. host of Den of Lore. To other people on, let's say, con the conspiracy board of uh, Reddit.com, I'm considered a right. part of the Illuminati. So, oh, you know, right. Okay, great. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's it, like I'm looking at the picture of um, of the sh uh, from Leonardo right now, and I, just, I, I see it as being part of his hair. That could be a design style choice. And as a designer, you know, we as designers do crazy things sometimes. Uh, like no, I think they are. I think they are horns, but I think we have to find out what the idea okay. that Leonardo had. Um, they do represent something specific, but I don't think it's demonic. Uh, maybe you could Google the actual meaning of that at some point during our three hours tonight. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure it has. Some, they are supposed to be horns, but there's a reason they're there, and I'm not entirely sure it's to do with demonism. I don't think so. But anyway, just keep going while we're talking. Maybe you'll find something, or maybe one of your listeners will be able to find something. Uh, now you'd said to Google, and I do apologize. I was I was responding to Michael in the chat here, but uh, uh, to, yeah. to Google which? Uh, to Google the reasons why the horns are represented on the statue. I mean, I'm sure I've read that somewhere, so I think it will be there on somewhere on on Google, I guess. Now, uh, to be able to move on while I'm Googling this, and normally I'd, yeah, I'd, sure. have, normally I'd have Alex do this, but Alex, you are in Costa uh -huh. Rica, you, you, and you just got married, so you're the luckiest man in the world, and your life just ended, so we'll see. <laughs> At least <laughs> no, the life is your right. <laughs> Now, I've been bugging him about it for the last while. I'm jealous because he's somewhere that's 45 degrees centigrade right now, when we're still at, like, uh, plus five with rain and snow. But, sure. <laughs> Now, how how is your now to be able to get in, into the the new chronology of Egypt? Yeah. And I I know that we've uh, I'm a a big proponent of at least looking at the evidence and looking at the evidence for what it is. So any theories open as uh, at least as far as that I can see until the research proves otherwise, and at least as far as considerations concerned. Yours has been right. one of the most compelling uh, e Egyptological. Uh, theories that I've seen since uh, since the water erosion on the Sphinx the theory from uh, from right. the, the the early mm -hmm. 1999 or I should say the the early 1990s uh, from Dr. Robert right. Shock and John Anthony West. Now how... we'll come back to that later because I'd like to comment on that later on if that's all right. Oh, we'd, we'd, I'd on. love to have the discussion on it. I, I wish that uh, okay. doc, uh, that Dr. Shock were here. He's currently traveling in Egypt at the moment, um, uh -huh. but uh, yeah, let's let's get into that later on. To okay. be able to start on that, how did the th like how how did you first come up with the theory? What was the basis of it? Okay, well, I told you <clears throat> that my PhD thesis was called the Third Intermediate Period in Egypt, or the chronology of, and uh, that's a subject that very few people want to tackle. There are very few specialists in Egyptology that uh, deal with the Third Intermediate Period in Egypt. For, for your listeners, that's the period from the 21st Dynasty to the 25th Dynasty. So it's immediately after the New Kingdom, the time of Ramesses II and Ramesses III, those great kings, and then Egypt falls into a sort of Dark Age period. It's not a complete Dark Age, but it's a it's 
it's a time when their power and their international reach has, has reduced dramatically. And then it, it revives again in the 26th dynasty and we get the sort of Sayite period or late period coming along and then you get the Persians and the, the Greeks and the Romans, etc. But uh, the collapse of the new kingdom is really the point at which Egypt really is no longer the great empire that it used to be. And so we fall into this quagmire of, of, of dark things going on. We've got tons of material from the third intermediate period, but it's trying to put the jigsaw puzzle together. That's always been the issue. Now, I'm, I always have loved problems, puzzles, trying to solve things. Um, I don't want to just read a book that doesn't solve a problem. I don't want to read a book that just repeats what everybody else has said in the past. I want to go, I want to stretch my imagination and to challenge myself to look at issues and problems and try and find ways to solutions and ways to resolve those questions, those anomalies that we find in the archaeology and in the histor historical reconstruction. So I, I got fascinated with this whole business, as you mentioned earlier, when Velikovsky first came out with his book, Ages in Chaos. Now, I didn't actually know about it when it first came out in the 50s, but I picked it up and read it in, I think, 1966 or something like that. I think it was when I first read it. Now, at that time, I'd, I'd got a good background in Egyptology from my childhood, so I knew the material, and I could obviously see that he'd got it completely wrong. Uh, however, he did fall or fall upon or focus on some areas which were certainly of great interest and i thought hmm, they're, they're great now is there another way to explain them that isn't the velikovsky in a way the you know by making these these dynasties uh, identical in other words you put make the 26th dynasty into the 19th dynasty and you'd have, you'd have uh, ramesses the second equated with neko the first all those are sort of things we're doing which really weren't historical you could prove it archaeologically you could look at the monuments and see they were quite different people his explanations of how he resolved his chronological revision were, were really weak however he did come across some very interesting things and one of those was the time when he placed the exodus in egypt which was in the 13th dynasty and that looked good to me that looked very interesting when you look at the archaeological evidence so i thought well you know those are interesting things but my job as an egyptologist was not to look at the bible it was to look at the chronology of egypt and the area where there was most contention and most problems was the third intermediate period so i thought this is a challenge that i want to tackle this is something i want to look at and so um, I was researching it from about so 65, 66, 67 onwards until I went to university in the and while I was doing my music, by the way, and then I went on to university in the in the 80s, and I brought all this material with me. Now I I got a place at University College London where there was only three places on offer, and my department, Egyptology department, took three undergraduates each year, and there were over 90 applications in my year for those three places. So when I went for my interview, because I knew so much about Egyptology uh, and ancient Egypt, and because I was a mature student, they snapped me up straight away, and I got one of those three places. And I spent my undergraduate period, the three years, actually debating with the postgraduate students and the professors in the postgraduate seminars, even though I was an undergraduate, because I knew more about the third intermediate period than most of them did. So uh, it was an obvious choice when I completed my BA, BA to go into doing a PhD on that very subject, third intermediate period chronology, because I could see there that was huge problems in the way that scholars had constructed that period over the last 150 years since they first began the decipherment of, of hieroglyphs and we began to recognize the names of kings. We started to piece them together into, into dynasties and we we started to construct the data that we could read now for the first time. And and what basically happened was that they overstretched the third intermediate period. They, they, they left huge spaces and gaps in it and made it really long and it was completely unnatural what was happening. And as a result of that, all the dynasties that came before the third intermediate period, before dynasty 21, all of them were pushed back in time because the third intermediate period had been overextended backwards in time. So the 19th dynasty was much older than the reality was, in my view. Same with the with the dynasties that went before the Middle Kingdom, etc. So you ended up with a, an overstretched Egyptian chronology. And the result of that was when you look beyond the borders of Egypt to places like Israel or Anatolia or Minoan Crete or whatever, all their histories were dependent on the Egyptian timeline because we find Egyptian artifacts scattered all over the ancient world and they date different levels of, of archaeology in those places because those places don't necessarily have literature or documentation like the Egyptians did. So they end up bequeathing the Egyptian timeline to all those different civilizations. 
Now, the problem was, once you look at Israel from the perspective of Egypt with this extended, overstretched timeline, nothing worked, nothing synchronized. The stories in the Bible simply did not fit with the Egyptian history. And so we end up with situations like Ramesses II as the Pharaoh of the Exodus, and yet all modern scholars accept now that there is no evidence at all of an Exodus or a massive uh, population of, of Hebrew Semites in, in the 19th dynasty Egypt, nor there was, the con was there a conquest of the promised land towards the end of the 19th dynasty. The cities that you know, were supposed to have been destroyed then had been destroyed donkeys years earlier. So nothing fitted. And so when I worked on my third intermediate period timeline, and I realized that some of the dynasties in that period overlapped, they, didn't, they weren't all sequential, they were actually overlapping each other in different parts of Egypt. So you had a line of kings in the northeast, and you had a line of kings in the south, another one in the, in, in the center, and they were all contemporary with each other, and yet we treated them as one single line, one line after another. And so we overstretched the chronology. So when I compressed it down again and brought it down to the tightest it could go, we find then that the 19th dynasty, Ramesses II and all those kings, come down in date. They become towards, more towards the present. And so they completely resynchronize with the biblical story. Everything slots into a different location historically. And then suddenly, when you look at the timeline then, you find that biblical history and Egyptian history actually work together. The, we start to see the evidence of the biblical stories within Egyptian history. Now, I do know that the, and I'm, I'm looking at the, uh, I can't pronounce the name of the, of the stele, but I know that there are several mentions of uh, Israel in, uh, in Egyptian literature and that have been carved on certain uh uh, certain not several walls. there's or, only two okay but uh, i i understand well if there's only two where we actually have the name the, the steel you're talking about is called the menepta stealer that's the one yes <clears throat> and menepta was the son of ramesses the second so if ramesses the second as a lot of scholars still maintain is the pharaoh of the exodus then when you get to his son meremta or menepta you find israel is already established in in palestine in, in canaan as a major important a political entity. Now that's not possible if Ramesses II was the Pharaoh of the Exodus because they should be wandering around the desert for 40 years. They can't be established as an important political entity in Canaan uh, on the generation immediately after Ramesses. That's not possible. So that is a clue that uh, told a lot of people there's something very wrong here. Um, you know, that Israel is equated in that stela with the Hittites. It's equated with the Libyans. It's equated with a really important power, Syria. So it's not, it's not some, some tribes wandering around the desert. You know, it can't possibly be that. So that was one doubt that, that was brought to everybody's attention about it. And then, very much more recently, they found another um, pedestal of a large statue. And they found this a part of this pedestal in the Berlin Museum. It had been lying there for about 60 or 70 years. And they realized that on the, steel, on the bottom of this pedestal were the same names as were on the Mernepta Stela, in cartouches or in name rings, and there was Israel again, sitting there on this thing. Now, <laughs> this statue belongs to hundreds of years before Ramesses II. So it shows you that Israel was already in existence in Canaan before Ramesses, and Ramesses therefore cannot be the Pharaoh of the Exodus. It's impossible. <clears throat> now, who, who have you been, uh, or at least who would you have determined to have been the Pharaoh that is part of the Exodus? That's a difficult one. Um, the way it works is very complicated. Um, first of all, you have the, the timeline revision, <clears throat> which obviously you're lowering the dates of the Egyptian kings before the 21st dynasty. So if we accept the biblical date of 1447 BC, roughly, for the Exodus, which is calculated on the basis of being 480 years before the, the time when Solomon built or laid the first stone of the temple in Jerusalem in his third year. So if you go, if you project back 480 years, you end up at 1447 BC, roughly, for the time when the Exodus took place. Now, without a revised Egyptian chronology, that places um, the Exodus in the 18th dynasty, in the mid-18th dynasty. But with a revised timeline, with the third intermediate period shortened, and therefore all the earlier dates come down, all the earlier kings come down in date, we end up with an Exodus in the, at the end of the 13th dynasty. So we're looking at that time period for an Exodus. Now, it just so happens that in the late 12th dynasty, a new uh, population of Semites arrives in Egypt. At the beginning, they're quite small, about 100, 150 people. They settle in the eastern delta, which is where the Bible calls it the land of Goshen. 
and and from there they expand and by several generations later they are something like 30,000 of them living in this place in a huge city called Avaris and then at the end of the 13th dynasty the whole bunch disappears the the whole site is abandoned all the semitic quarter is just abandoned and they, they just disappear off the face of the earth and and uh, and what we have is plague pits in the ground just immediately beforehand where bodies are being tossed in and all sorts of stuff like that and then a little time later cities like jericho are destroyed and burnt to the ground and they're left uh, in that state for four to six hundred years when there's no occupation in Jericho and all the other cities that we hear about in the conquest narratives of Joshua are also destroyed at that time so it matches the story of the Bible so well the story of the sojourn of the Israelites from Joseph through to Moses and the ex and the slavery period then the exodus then the conquest of the promised land under Joshua it's all there in the archaeology of Egypt and, and the Holy Land so it's obvious that we're looking for an exodus in the time of the late 13th dynasty. And in that particular context, we have a, um, a story, a narrative by uh, somebody called Manetho, who was a priest of Egyptian priest. Uh, and he wrote a history of Egypt. And we unfortunately only have a redaction of his work now. We don't have the, the full literary text. But we do have a particular quotation that was quoted by, quoted, quoted by Josephus, who had access to Manetho before it, it, the final manuscript was destroyed. And Josephus uh, actually quotes Manetho, and he tells us that in the time of a king called Tutimaeus, don't forget he's writing in Greek now, so the name Tutimaeus is the Greek form of an Egyptian pharaoh's name. In that time, God, in the singular, smote the Egyptians. Something happened to the Egyptians, and they equate it with the smiting of God. And then immediately afterwards, as a result of this smiting, there's an invasion of Egypt by these people called the Hyksos. And mm -hmm. they come in, and they are able to come in and attack Egypt and take it over. And the, the text says, without striking a blow, there's no resistance. Egypt doesn't have an army to defend itself. So these people just come across the Sinai, and they take over Egypt for about 160 years. And, uh, and they dominate it, and they virtually enslave the Egyptians. I mean, it's like the turning of the tide, as it were. Um, so that, again, is very, very interesting, because that Tutimaeus character we know to be a pharaoh called Dudimos, who was just about the last king of the 13th mm. dynasty. So it looks like in his reign, God smote the Egyptians, and then the Egyptian army was destroyed, and these marauders came in because there was nobody to defend Egypt, and invaded Egypt and conquered it. Now, that's like the story of the Israelites leaving Egypt and the Egyptian army being destroyed in the Yamsuf, the Sea of Reeds. And there was no Egyptian army to defend it, and so the Hyksos came in. So the whole story tied together from Joseph all the way through to the conquest of the Promised Land in the archaeology of Egypt and Canaan, with also the corroborative evidence from Manetho himself. Now, for the Hyksos <clears throat> invasion... Uh, yeah. Again, Ramses II wouldn't have been part of that that dynasty. That would have been afterwards. Is that That's correct? much later. Okay. That's much later. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for at least according to uh, at least from uh, what has been shown here, that's around 1250 BC according to the standard chronology. Uh, yeah. And I know that the Phoenicians or the Sea Peoples had come much m around that time as well. There... A little bit later, about a hundred years later. Okay. Yeah. There's no eighty years later. So yeah. there's no connection between between those two, um, uh, you know, between those two invasions. At that point, most of that part of the world was was under uh, complete upheaval. But some some uh, archaeologists do date the 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 decline of that part of the world starting at around 1500 BC, give or take, you know, a century or two. Is uh, how, well, how that's that... the, the two phases. There are two phases here. There's mm -hmm. the Hyksos invasion, which is <laughs> it's essentially before the beginning of the New Kingdom. Mm -hmm. it, it it brings an end to the Middle Kingdom. The Middle Kingdom is the era we've just been talking about with these big Semitic mm -hmm. population in Egypt. Then there's this thing called the Second Intermediate Period, which is the Hyksos era. And then we get the New Kingdom, where the Hyksos are thrown out of Egypt, and, and we get a recovery, and we get this rise of the powerful military kings, like Thutmose III of the 18th Dynasty, and eventually... Seti the first and Ramesses the second. This is after Akhenaten, who sandwiched in between those. And then at the at the beginning of the twentieth dynasty, we have Ramesses the third, and that's when the Sea Peoples invade. Invade, and that's a different effort because that's a result of a collapse of the Late Bronze Age. That's the time of the Trojan War. This is the time when the Greek world, the Indo-European world, are beginning to rise up and dominate the Middle East. So you get an invasion of sea peoples who are effectively 
Indo-Europeans, they're Philistines, they're, they're Cheka, Chukaroi, as they call it in Homer. They're, they are Peleset, which is Philistine. The Danuna, which is the Danoi of, of again, with the Greeks who fought against the Trojans in the Trojan War. These are all Indo-Europeans who are moving down into the Levant because there's a, a sort of domino effect. There are other peoples coming in from the steppe lands and pushing them southwards from, from Europe into, into the Mediterranean. And so this is a different thing. This is a collapse of the late Bronze Age empire. This is not the same thing as the Hyksos era, which is a lot easier, earlier, which was actually resulted in the collapse of the Middle Bronze Age. So we're talking about two completely different eras where history didn't quite repeat itself, but there were similarities in the sense there were two invading armies at two completely different periods coming down into the Levant, coming down towards Egypt, principally because Egypt was the breadbasket of the ancient world. When there was ever famine in those regions, everybody headed, headed for Egypt because Egypt had the Nile and therefore it would survive famines. If there was desiccation in the north, people headed down to the Nile. That was the safe zone where they would come for refuge. And so these, these things do repeat themselves in history, but we're talking about three to four hundred years difference between the Hyksos invasion and the, and the so-called Philistine or Sea Peoples invasion. And one of the uh, one of the individuals that is in the chat right now, and uh, it, it is Michael. He's the one that's that's throwing a lot of the questions. And again, Michael, thank you very much for this one. Uh, he's wondering how the Hittites would would uh, fit into this. <clears throat> Raquel, let's not confuse Hittites with Hyksos. They're very different people. Okay. But Hittites Hittites are Indo-Europeans. They originated originally from the steppe lands, the Kurgan culture to the north of the Black Sea. And they, and they were originally a Luwian people. They're, they're people with an Indo-European language who, who, who came around from either side of the Black Sea and entered the, what we call Anatolia or modern Turkey today. Mm -hmm. Some of them actually settled in Troy, in Troy too. So the Trojans were Luwians and others settled down the coast at Miletus and other places down there. The Luca, the Lycians in the southwest of Anatolia. But the Hittites came across from the east side of the, of the Black Sea and they arrived in central Anatolia in the plateau region. And they actually invaded that region. The Hattic peoples in that region were overthrown by them. And they became the rulers of a place called Hattusha. Mm -hmm. And Hattusha is the capital of the Hittites. The Hittites were actually called Hatti in the ancient languages. So Hattusha and Hatti are the same, are the same thing, basically. The Hittites is the biblical terminology for them. So these people are Indo-Europeans, and they were a very strong, vigorous northern folk. I mean, they were you know, hardy. These are hardy. A bit like you Canadians. I mean, they had very <laughs> cold winters. You know, they're, they're not mamby-pamby southerners. Uh, and uh, and so they, they became the principal enemy of Egypt during the 19th dynasty, principally because... Um, what happened was that the great king Suppiluma the first. You try saying that when you've had a few drinks. Um, I couldn't. <laughs> no, he he was the great emperor of the new kingdom uh, of of the Hittites, and uh, when Tutankhamun was, we think, possibly murdered or died in battle or whatever, his widow Ankhesenamun wrote to Suppiluma in in the Hittite lands and said. I've got no heir. I, you know, I'm here, the queen. I'm the widow queen, and I'm being forced to marry a commoner, you know, a military man. We we turns out to be a, a guy called Ayu, becomes the next pharaoh, who is actually a, a general in the army and a vizier. And she, he she writes to the Hittite emperor, says, "Please send me your son, so that he can become pharaoh, and we can unite our two lands in this pact between the two great empires of Egypt and and Hatti land." And, and and we will then rule together, and I will marry royalty. I won't marry a commoner. But on the way down, he sends his, Suppliuma sends his son Zananza down to Egypt, and he's murdered on, on the doorstep of Egypt, probably by Ai's cohorts, his, his spies or whatever. So this poor Hittite prince is bumped off, and that starts a hundred-year war between the Hittites and the Egyptians. Because after Tutankhamun's death and after the end of the 18th dynasty, we find that the kings of like the... Seti the first and Ramesses the second are fighting all their wars against the Hittites, so they are a very very powerful northern enemy of Egypt until they eventually sign a peace treaty with Ramesses the second, and then they become allies. But they are the the other great superpower of the region during the 19th dynasty. That's absolutely fascinating, and I know that I've probably read that somewhere. And I know that the the, the Hittites uh, had used cats as a kind of a a cat shield during some of one of their more, more famous battles, uh, if I'm not mistaken, which kind of sounds... 
A cat shield? What do you mean by a cat shield? Well, they, the, 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 the theory goes that they had put cat. They knew that the Egyptians had revered cats as gods, so they oh, basically I put see. cats out in front of their army, knowing the Egyptians wouldn't attack. Um, we at the Den of Lore, being cat-friendly people, and my official co-host being Coco, my ten-year-old, uh, uh, yeah. uh, you know, English Blue, she yeah. she probably wouldn't like that at all, and I don't think she likes to telling that story. I don't think she would. I don't think she particularly <laughs> want to be strung upon a Hittite shield. But I've never heard that before. Is that another folklore thing that you've come across? It, it's it's a possibility. It's... It's certainly not in the narratives that we have from the battles. And we have two versions of the battles. We have the Hittite version, and we have the Ramesses II version, many copies of it on the walls of the temples. And that isn't the ruse which actually nearly comes to Ramesses' end. The The way that the story goes is that uh, the, the Hittites were hiding in the mist. Their chariot force was hiding in the mist on the east side of, the, of Kardesh, the city. And the Egyptians arrived on the west side and they were strung out several days march back through Canaan. And so the Hittites swooped round and attacked Ramesses in his camp before the rest of the Egyptian army could arrive and obliterated half the army. And uh, it was so-called bravery on the part of the king Ramesses II that able to turn the tide. Where, and then when uh, the Nairin arrived, a, a group of mercenaries came to to relieve Ramesses. They managed to defeat, to, to defeat the Hittites in the battle itself or at least create a poor situation where the Hittites were not victorious. But that is the story that is, is described on the walls of the temples, and I'm not sure about cats, whether cats come into it, except I have to say, Ramesses did have a pet lion in his camp with him when he was attacked by the Hittites, so there is one cat there. <laughs> well, at least at least we can we can close that cat, uh, that catastrophe of a battle, and please... Yeah, catastrophe is a good one, <clears throat> I like that. Yeah. <laughs> now I know we've gotten a little off track, uh, let's let's circle back around and start with yeah. um, uh, start back with uh, Abraham in Egypt uh, during the yeah. uh, 1832 BC and see if we can catch back up to where we were. Okay, okay. Well, um, Abraham is a difficult one to pin down. We don't. I mean, the thing about archaeology and the thing about history is you're never going to be able to find everybody uh, that, that ever lived. You know, any any person that's mentioned in literature. And in this particular case, we are absolutely we have nothing for Abraham. We do have considerable amount of material for Joseph. We, we don't have a lot for Moses, to be honest, and we have a little bit for, for Joshua, or at least the, the history around Joshua's story. Uh, and you wouldn't expect to really find that much material about these figures because they were chieftains wandering the around Canaan. Abraham was a very wealthy chieftain. Uh, but he wouldn't necessarily appear in documentation, you know, you know, because the thing about pastoralists is that they, they wind and weave their way through civilization. All the city states, they're not city dwellers. Remember the story of Lot. Uh, so he's the one that goes and lives in the city, but Abraham refuses to do it. And he wants to go. He has his camp at the Oak of Marmara in near Hebron. So he's a he's a pastoralist. He's a wealthy pastoralist, but he wanders through this sort of civ-like structure of civilization that you have in the ancient world. So you're not going to find him in the records as such. He's not going to turn up. Abraham is not going to turn up in the records necessarily, unless you're very lucky. So we have to look for the, the type of environment and historical period that he would fit into best. And that is the time when the Amorites are moving down from north Syria into Canaan. So these are people just like Abraham, who's called a wandering Aramean, and, and they come down and they occupy various parts of Canaan within the city-state system that we have in that period of time. So and then eventually he ends up in Egypt, as you know, and he, he messes around there for a bit and then he leaves back again and he goes back into the, into the promised land or the so-called promised land promised him by God in one of his visions. And then um, he is the begatter whatever that means, and we're not sure whether that actually means son, uh, a father of a son, or whether it means uh, the beginning of a dynasty. We're not sure about that. Um, but let's say, for instance, that he is the, the father of Isaac, and then Isaac is the father of Jacob, and Jacob is the father of Joseph, and Joseph is the one that then comes back to Egypt and starts the whole process of bringing those Israelites, those, those sons of Jacob, because Jacob is called Israel, into, uh, into Goshen, into the eastern delta, settles them there, and then we get this massive expansion in the city of Avaris, and we know the story of the sojourn and the slavery and the exodus, and then the conquest of the promised land. So Abraham is the progenitor of this group of people. Abraham is the one who received the vision that God promises the land to him or, or to his generations that follow him. And Israel is the 
who is Jacob, is the eponymous ancestor of the Israelites. They, they are named after him. Now, there are many other Semites in Egypt, uh, w- which we can call for argument's sake Hebrews, because it's, it's an interesting thing, this, that everybody thinks Hebrews are, are Israelites. Well, Israelites were Hebrews, but not all Hebrews were Israelites. The word Hebrew is actually a term that, that means it's equivalent to, I suppose, the word gypsy in our modern language today. They're wanderers. They're people who are not part of the, the system. They don't pay their taxes. They don't live in cities. They, 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 they wander through the land, as it were. And that's what a Hebrew really is. So Hebrews are not just Israelites. Other, other are Hebrews as well as Israelites. Israelites are specifically those people who are born or descended from Jacob. That's specifically who Israelites are. And so Israelites are Hebrews, but they're not all, not all Hebrews are Israelites. And so you find the term Hebrew used in the Bible as a pejorative. Uh, it's, it's the enemies of Israel, the Pharaoh or the Philistines who call them Hebrews. The, he, the, the actual Israelites don't call themselves Hebrews. Now, I know that <clears throat> within patterns of uh, evidence, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the Israelis were normally called uh, uh, Semites, and they were referred to as Semites. Uh, based on the idea that you know it's it's uh, uh, the the following of one god that that's kind of what it's it ha- has been attributed to is there yeah. is there is the, is there a particular origin for that uh, for that term well they they're not called semites because that word isn't a word that you find in ancient egypt they're called amu a a m u or aleph a m u uh, and that word means asiatic but what asiatic doesn't mean as we understand it today like chinese or japanese or Asiatic in those were in that world meant somebody for, who spoke spoke a Semitic language like Arabs, like uh, Mesopotamian peoples uh, who spoke Semitic language as opposed to Hamitic language, which is what Egyptian was. And so these we call them Semites because they spoke Semitic languages, but that term is not used in in the ancient world. Okay, so. Semites is the, is the people who smoke, spoke a Semitic language, specifically with the, with the Israelites. It's Hebrew is a, a Northwest Semitic language. Akkadian, the language of Mesopotamia, is an East Semitic language. Arab, Arabic is a West Semitic language. So you have, you have these different dialects, different forms of Semitic languages. But the term that was used in the ancient world for these people is Amu. And that word means basically an Asiatic or a person who was not part of the original Canaan or part of Egypt. Now I know that with Joseph, uh, there apparently was a, uh, a pyramid tomb that was found. Uh, yeah. And in that pyramid tomb, excuse me, a uh, yeah. little cough there in my throat. The, pyra- okay. the pyramid tomb, there was a statue that had a red hair with yellow skin, and that yeah. was how Asiatics were were described at at, at that point in time. Some of them were, not all. Um, we can't say that everybody who, who was an Asiatic had red hair. A lot of them had dark brown hair or black hair. Um, but there are this particular individual, and what you can say, of course, is that no Egyptians had red hair. So it's, it tends to sort of, by process of elimination, a yellow-skinned person with red hair with a throw stick over his shoulder as a scepter of office. That throw stick is a typical weapon of these people that you use for hunting, etc. It's like a boomerang. Um, and, and that very weapon is the u- a word or a sign that's used in the Egyptian hieroglyphs as a determinative or a character reference to people who were Amu, who were Asiatic. So the mere fact that he's holding this this uh, boomerang thing, this 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 throw stick in his in his hand tells you that he's an Asiatic. He's not an Egyptian. <clears throat> However, even though he's got yellow skin and he's got red hair and he's got this throw stick, He's in a, an Egyptian tomb. He's got an Egyptian tomb, which is not an Asiatic thing. And he's got an Egyptian palace right next door, which, again, is not an Asiatic thing. So he seems to be a very high official of state who is a foreigner, who is working for Pharaoh. He lives in the northeast delta in the land of Goshen. He has a palace there. He has a, a, a tomb built for him in the back garden of the palace, which is a pyramid tomb. And on the front of the pyramid tomb, there is a chapel built. And inside the chapel, they found the smashed remains of this statue that you're, you're describing, which was a twice life size. It was a colossal statue, a seated statue of this figure. And so to, to have a, a pyramid tomb is, first of all, an extraordinary honor, because in this period of the late 12th dynasty, when this, this tomb was uh, built, uh, only pharaohs had pyramid tombs. Nobody else had pyramid tombs. No private individual or commoner would do so. He had a palace. 
and they all know it's not a king's palace. It's a it's a fabulous building. You know, that's something that only a very very high ranking official would have. And and so and he has a colossal statue, funerary statue, which again nobody had that in those days apart from kings. So this guy is unique. This guy is extraordinary. He'd on, been honoured by the pharaoh to such a degree that he'd been given a royal tomb, effectively. And then when they, when I examined this statue, uh, on the back shoulder of the, the remains of the upper part of the torso, I noticed that there was coloured coloured paint left on on the statue because it had been in the ground all these years for thousands of years. It had preserved the colour, and it was a coat of stripes in multicolours. With a with a collar which was painted uh, also in multicolours, so this guy with the red hair and a yellow skin, who was a high official of state, given a palace and a royal burial, had a coat of many colours on. Now there aren't that many people in history that we know of with that combination, and the one we can think of immediately is Joseph with his coat of many colours, who was a high vizier of Egypt, honoured by Pharaoh and retired, obviously in the place where he. He'd settled his brothers and father in the land of Goshen. This is exactly where this palace and tomb were found. And uh, again, this is probably not going to... <laughs> I'm guessing there probably weren't any Andrew Lloyd Webber songs that were sung at his funeral, unfortunately. Not quite. Not quite, exactly. <laughs> no, I don't think that would have been the case. But it just goes to show that how a tradition can carry through to modern times, doesn't it? That is the thing we remember about Joseph, more than anything else is the multicolor coat. And there he is in this tomb with wearing his multicolor coat. It's quite extraordinary. Now, the temple, or I should say the burials uh, area of uh, of Aris that has been uh, uncovered by uh, <clears throat> the Egyptologist uh, BTAC, th- yeah. this, this happened recently. This hasn't been something that, that's uh, come out within the last 20 years, has it? I, I, I know well, that... It's a, it's a bit earlier than that. It's a little bit earlier, but not much. I mean, in terms of archaeology, everything's recent. Uh, you know, I mean, we, we've only been doing it for about 200 years at the most. But the, the tomb was found in the 70s. 1970s but the attribution of it to the biblical uh, Israelites is something very new Betak himself didn't recognize what he'd got as being Joseph and the settlement of the Hebrews there mainly because he adheres to the concept that Ramesses the second or later is the time of the Exodus so he can't possibly think about his middle bronze age excavations in Avaris can be at, connected at all to the Israelite story because they're, they're separated by 400 years so there's no way that you can think of it in that way if you're sticking to the conventional dating system so he calls them Asiatics it was me who came along and then said well hang on a minute you know if the timeline's wrong this synchronizes correctly with the time of Joseph and the Sojourn and, and Moses, then this all fits together nicely. But of course, I'm up against it with the conventional thinking because most Egyptologists, it has to be admitted, are prepared to change their timeline. They're not in the business of doing that. And so it's going to be a little bit like continental drift theory. It's going to take, you know, a, a generation or more before the theory is either going to be accepted or rejected. It's not going to happen overnight. Now, I know that within uh, Patterns of Evidence, there actually, like he did say on camera that the connection between um, <clears throat> the, the peoples who had settled there and, uh, you know, let's say them being Israelis who had settled there is quite weak based based upon, uh, you're just based upon that 1250 BC chronology that he was following. <clears throat> now, yeah. <clears throat> it's slightly more complicated than that because BTAC is of the opinion that oral tradition cannot survive more than a couple, two or three generations. I don't agree with that at all. I think oral tradition is extremely tenacious. You can find, for instance, in the Balkans, you can find singers who sing the stories going back thousands of years of their history. I mean, and and Homer's another good example of the, the type of thing that the people learn stories by rote and they perform them and sing them. Uh, and and they, in the form of poetry or whatever it is. So oral tradition is very powerful. And I think that his problem is that he can't see an oral tradition going back to the time of the late 12th dynasty when we've got this, this pyramid and palace being the story of Joseph that carried through orally through the traditions until the writing down of the Torah. However, of course, he doesn't accept the fact that Moses could write. So, um, you know, so he's not in the business of saying, well, maybe there were written records going back to the time of Moses. He's not in that business. So he has to rely on oral tradition. And yet he says that oral tradition cannot survive for four or five centuries. 
uh, uh, coming from uh, my fam- my family is actually from the Balkans, believe it or not. Right. Uh, all right. So, and my father bl- used to actually sing folk songs uh, f- back in right. his village. So he, uh, yes, the, the the folk songs that they sing now, and even that are still popular now. And I'm I'm, yeah. I'm DJing a uh, a, a folk uh, a folk dance fundraiser this Saturday. All <laughs> oh, right. And I, I can I can tell you that the songs that I'm going to be playing, even though they are recent. Uh, recordings of those songs, those same songs are still two, three hundred years old or older. Yeah, they stretch. Yeah, they can do. And 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 it, you, you don't. Uh, if it's a story as as something as dramatic as the Exodus story, you know that's sealed in the cultural memory of a people. You know they're not. I mean, they're going to elaborate upon it. They're going to change it. They're going to aggrandize certain aspects of the story. But the basic nuts and bolts of the story will be remembered, passed on from generation to generation. That is what the Passover celebration is all about. Every single year, Jewish people celebrate the departure from Egypt of the Israelites, and that's been going on for thousands of years. That's why it's retained in their culture, because they have rituals that remind them, and they read passages from Exodus at Passover to remind them of what happened all those thousands of years ago. And I know, uh, at least I know the answer from this from the amount of documentaries that I've watched on on uh, e- uh, Egyptian history. Some of our listeners yeah. may not necessarily know why, it, knowing that the Egyptians had carved everything on walls, uh, as yeah. far as the history, why is there no record of the uh, the Exodus? Well, apart from Manetho, which I mentioned earlier on, and this this mentioned there, um, and you you would not expect, to be honest. Uh, propagandizing defeats. It's like you know you don't really expect Trump to start telling everybody in the world how 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 terrible everything is in America at the moment or is going to be in the future. The the thing that happens on the walls of Egyptian temples is they commemorate victories, they commemorate great deeds, they they make heroic uh, inscriptions. They're not going to tell you about defeats. They're not going to tell you that the Egyptian army was destroyed in the Yamsuf, the Sea of Reeds. They're not going to tell you any of that. Because that would just be silly to do that. Nobody does that. That's not good propaganda. So you would not expect records of that type of thing. However, we do have a document. We do have something called the Ipua Papyrus or the what's called the Admonitions of an Egyptian Sage, which was probably written down at about the same time, about the 13th dynasty. We think it was written down or for the first time or slightly later than that, recording a time when Egypt was completely overthrown where there was terrible tragedy in Egypt, awful stuff. The river turned into blood. Uh, Children were dying. Uh, People were starving. The crops were being destroyed. Darkness fell upon the land. All these things you hear about in the Ten Plagues are there in this Ipua papyrus. So it looks like there is a record, but it's not a monumental record of it on the walls of the temples because they would never do that. Now, this papyrus uh, sounds... Something like a well, it be, being a historical document itself, and knowing that uh, there are many things that could have happened around the world at that time that could have caused yeah. this type of cataclysm. Of it, course, is there, is there has there been any indication that this is may may have been caused by let's say volcanic uh, eruption or meteor impact of any kind within the area? Well, it, volcanic eruption is certainly a possibility, but it's not the Thera eruption that you're thinking of. It's not the Santorini blowout, Middle Bronze Age blowout, that's a different event. But that doesn't mean to say that there's not another volcano somewhere around the planet which has caused dust to get up into the atmosphere, which darkens the sky and and results in crop failure. That is perfectly possible as an explanation for this. Who knows? I mean, uh, religious people would say it was the miraculous. It was the, you know, it was the work of God. But there are other mechanisms to explain these things. So, yes, there is entirely possible that climate change was, was, was brought about by a volcanic eruption somewhere but it's not the Santorini Thera eruption that's a different date okay so we can't use that one to mm-hmm. to explain it however I mean there 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 are some of those um, effects if you like of the ten plagues can be explained in different ways I mean the the river turning into blood is nothing to do with a volcano for instance uh, the frogs coming out of the water the the boils all those things are nothing to do with the volcano the darkness might be Uh, Those sorts of things right at the end of the 10 plagues is a possibility, but the earlier plagues have nothing to do with volcanic activity as far as I can see. And what what would you attribute it to? Oh, now you've got it. Well, (laughs) first of of all, you've got to accept they happened, haven't you? I mean, uh, just because it's in the... 
in the story of Exodus doesn't mean those plagues are anything but literary invention. I mean, that's one possibility. As I said to you before, I mean, you, you can take the nuts and bolts of the story, which is a population of Semites coming to Egypt. They expand dramatically. They are enslaved. They leave Egypt. They settle in the Promised Land and they burn all the cities there. Those are tangible things you can grab hold of as an archaeologist. You can look at the evidence in the ground. I can't dig up evidence of miracles. That's not my job to do that, nor will I ever find one. You know, I can't prove that the, the, the Yam Suf Sea parted through archaeology. And there's no way I can do that. So I want to stick with the, the things I can test, not the miraculous. So you're never going to find evidence in archaeology from 3,000 odd years ago of boils or of frogs or of, of rivers turning red. No, but again, when it comes to archaeology, the uh, history of me being able to actually graduate college to some people is somewhat of a surprise, but I was actually quite right. good. <laughs> right. so, some people attribute that to a miracle, some people attribute that to hard work or something else. So I can understand how that dichotomy between the two can be difficult for some individuals to to either, yeah. uh, you know, to be able to wrap their heads around or say, no, it's not a miracle, it's actually archaeological evidence. Uh, now, I know that there are some things within that history that uh, can kind of link the two between uh, the historical exodus period to the real life. And I know that there are certain names that have been found within documents that actually do appear in the Bible. Yes, um, that's certainly true. And there's no reason why they shouldn't. Um, just like anything, I mean, you know, how many Davids are there in the, on the planet? Plenty, I'm sure. So, uh, yes, we, we have King David himself has now turned up in the archaeological record, although it's not him specifically, specifically. It's the house of David. In other words, the dynasty of David has turned up on a particular stealer from Tel Dan. Yeah, it, we, he seems to apparently to be also mentioned in the Moabite stone, which is in, from Transjordan. So there are possibly two mentions of King David or his dynasty. Certainly kings like Ahab, who come later on in the divided monarchy period, are mentioned in Assyrian text. And there are many kings of the, of the period of, of Ahab and that time, the divided monarchy period, are mentioned in Assyrian records. We have no record of a Solomon at the moment uh, has turned up yet and of course many of the characters in judges we're not wouldn't expect those to really turn up but we have it seems uh we have one or two characters who can be equated with the time of king saul who turn up in the amana letters our famous arcanatan again turning up um, so there are there are some names there that I think are related to the time of King Saul, the people around that reign period, who of course was the first king of Israel. And of course we have the possibility of Joseph himself, although in his particular case it's a little bit difficult because he came to Egypt as a slave. He then rose to power as the second most important person in the land after Pharaoh, and he was given an Egyptian name. So... You have to find the Egyptian name for him, really. That's what will be in the records, not his Semitic name. And we we do think we've found that. Um, his name in the Bible, the Egyptian name is in the Bible, is called Zaphanath Pa'anea. Okay, you want to try saying that when you've had three or four whiskeys. <laughs> Zaphanath Pa'anea. Zaphanath is actually a distorted version in the Hebrew of Jedoanef, which was probably pronounced Zatanath which means he who is called. And what we find is we have these Semitic slave lists in this period where Zatanaf, or he who is called, is how they always name people. It's like um, uh, African slaves who are brought into the cotton fields of South, uh, southern United States are given English names. They don't keep their African names. They're called George or whatever. So that the same thing happened with the slaves in Egypt. They lost their Semitic name. So you have such and such a name, he who is called, and then they're given an Egyptian name. So Zatanaf means he who is called. And then Pa'anea is actually the Egyptian name that Joseph is given. So Pa'anea means it actually Anea is how the Egyptians pronounce the word Ankh, the sign of life. Okay? So Pa is the definite article. So Pa'anea means the one who lives because Ankh is the sign of life, okay? So, and that's quite an appropriate name given to Joseph, because if you remember rightly, his father, Jacob, thinks he's been killed. Uh, his brothers, when they throw him down the well, they take his multicolored coat that he's been given by his father, they cover it in blood, and they take it back to the father, and they tell him that, the, that his son, is, his favorite son, has been killed by a wild beast. And so his, his father thinks he's dead. And then donkeys years later, when the Israelites go into into um, Egypt because of the famine, they find vizier 
the vizier Joseph there, and there he is in his grandeur, okay? And Jacob suddenly discovers his son's alive. So what an appropriate name that Pharaoh gives him, the one who lives. So that actually makes a lot of sense. So if if his name is the one who lives, Pa'ank or Pa'anea, then he's most likely the vizier of Egypt at the end of the 12th dynasty, who was called the overseer of the fields, in other words, the minister of agriculture. Remember, Joseph's job was to gather in the grain and, and to then distribute it out to the people during the famine years. And, and also the, the granaries are actually named after this character. And we read his name in Egyptian as Anku, which is the same as Aneach, it's mm-hmm. the same name. So he's the very famous vizier. He deals with all the agriculture of the land. He builds the granaries, and that's exactly the story of Joseph, who gathers together the grain. He he develops a, a, a state system of gathering grain and redistribution after granaries in the famine years. So he fits very well. So we may well have found Joseph in the Egyptian historical records. Now, this at least also does give me an, uh, an expl- explanation for the uh, band names from when you were younger. So this, oh yeah. Well, again, we're, we're delving into the musical side of things. Okay. <laughs> well, I just wanted to be able to comment because you'd mentioned That's that Ankh signs of life. I'm like, oh, this actually makes sense now because I know yeah, that. Yeah, it does. So yeah. it, okay, well, that's good to know. <laughs> Sorry no, to digress. No, it's, it's, no, it's not. You see, that's my child upbringing again. When I was into Egyptology when I was a kid, and then when I formed my first band at the age of 16, of course, the first thing I was going to do was give it an Egyptian name. So the very first band I had was called The Sign of Life, and the second band I had was called Ankh, which is the Egyptian version of The Sign of Life. So that was, you know, that was in my teen years, and uh, yeah, that's my influences. In fact, a lot of the songs that we recorded in those days and we performed live were actually named after Egyptian gods or Egyptian kings or whatever. So it was very weird, totally weird. It was sort of like 1960s rock with Egyptian names and stuff involved in the lyrics. Very strange stuff. It actually reminds me a little bit of uh, the ba- the band Sunspot, who also are the ho- or two of the uh, people in the band are the hosts of this one podcast called See You on the Other Side, and a lot of their songs are actually based on paranormal, ex- you know, either paranormal experiences uh, from other people or themes, and they they bring that entire, uh, you know, the the entire idea of the unknown into w- within their songs, so they they carry that theme throughout a lot of it, and they're they're quite popular within within Wisconsin. Uh, right. So that's uh, that. That's cool that you do that. It's you're 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 not the only person who has done that, and I know that the, there are others who carry that theme forward. <clears throat> right. And with regards to themes, and speaking of themes, I know that one of the themes of the show is to at least question, um, uh, you know, standard, uh, the way the way that people look at things. And most of your right. work has been, uh, <clears throat> I should say, one of your main opponents within uh, your theory has been uh, Kenneth uh, Kitchen whom yeah. your work actually rewrites completely if it's accepted. Now, True. Is, uh, now considering this affects his work, do you think that this is more towards his idea of ego, and is this something that is prevalent within Egyptology or archaeology as a whole, or is it a matter of uh, you know him believing that it's this way and he has the evidence for it? I think it, we, we've got to be careful we don't sort of like tar people too much with the brush, because... These guys have spent their entire careers trying to explain the, away the problems of Egyptian chronology and Egyptian history. And they built their careers on apologetics, effectively. I mean, they, they've constructed a history that is full of uh, difficulties, and uh, they, they spend a lot of time. I mean, some, some professors have spent their entire careers writing about the Dark Ages of Greece, for instance, which in this new chronology are completely wiped out with a stroke of a brush. Because those dark ages are created by a false Egyptian chronology, so and and they're very very brilliant men, and I like them greatly. I mean, I was taught by a number of them. You know that they are real, you know, giants in the field. In the case of Kenneth Kitchen, he is um, not only the great, the high priest of chronology in terms of uh, the fact that everybody bows down to him as the guy who created the chronology we work with today. He's the sort of master chronologist, if you like, but he's also a devout Christian. And now that means that he is absolutely affixed on the idea that Ramesses the second is the fur of the Exodus because in the first chapter of the book of Exodus, it says that the Israelites built a city called Ramses. And, of course, that is the one thing that they latch on to, to say, well, if they built a city called Ramses, the pharaoh must have been called Ramses at the time. And that is where it all comes from, that one one mention in the Bible there. 
So it's it's easy to understand why he's defended his position so strongly. It's easy to understand why he's attacked me so harshly, because I'm effectively upsetting the apple cart for him. Everything I've said goes against what he's been teaching and writing about for the last 40 years. Now, it's very interesting because we, we actually had a debate in, in the UK, in the University of Reading, which uh, was organized. And it was me and K- Kenneth Kitchen debating the exodus and the dates for the exodus. And um, before this, he'd been lambasting me. He'd been basically saying I was an idiot and nothing that I said was real and, and all the rest of it. And I sort of kept my cool pretty much. And uh, and as I say, I respect the man. And uh, so we had this debate in front of 400 odd people sitting in the audience. Uh, and it was a full blown, full day of debate. And at the end of the debate, at the final session, when we all sat down to discuss the lectures, etc., in front of the audience, he admitted and it's on film, we've got it on film, he admitted that my date for the Exodus and my arguments for the Exodus, and this is as far as he could go, were as powerful as his version of the Exodus and his date for the Exodus. In other words, he wasn't prepared to concede me, to me, the entire argument, but he was prepared at the end of that debate to say, yes, David, you have a strong argument which is as strong as mine. Okay, so having lambasted me for tw- for 15 years, <coughs> he actually said I was 98% rubbish, uh, which is what he actually wrote. And then with inflation, within a couple of years, it had gone on to up to 100% rubbish. But after that, he, he actually he conceded the fact that the arguments I'd put forward and I'm putting forward are actually as powerful as his own view. Now, this is a theme that I'm, again, not trying to paint everyone with with the same brush, as it were, but I, uh, two, two episodes ago, we had Robert, uh, Dr. Robert Schock on, on the show, yeah. and mm-hmm. uh, he discussed the hardships that he had uh, um, experienced during the time that his uh, redating of the Sphinx theory came out and that he sure. was he was shouted mm-hmm. at and spit on by by uh, you know other researchers and basically co- you know called garbage as it were and, and that they were wrong mm-hmm. why is there a at least somewhat of a theme or a recurring theme that uh, I myself and some of the other listeners may have heard uh, who believe in looking at alternate theories why is it that there are such a, 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 a such attacks, and why do people take it so personally if they do? Is this is this a uh, like is this something that's common or or not? Well, people don't like change, especially academics, especially in the history fields. Scientists tend to be a bit more liberal minded. Science is a, a a discipline of looking forward to the future. History, by its very nature, is looking to the past, looking backwards. So historians, people working in the history fields, as it were, the history disciplines, tend to be quite conservative in their views. And those young bucks who come along at university straight out of school, some of them, they sit at the the foot of their professor's gown, as it were, listening to this pontification from a man who is, is superior in age and superior in intellect and superior in knowledge, and they take it as truth. They take it as reality. And so they go on to replicate effective what they're taught when they become their professors in turn. And usually the, the guys who are still hanging around at university holding on to the coattail of the professor are the ones that have not gone out in the big world and got jobs in banking and getting paid like $300,000 a, a year. You know, the, the bright sparks, the ones with dynamism are the ones that have left the university. The only ones that are left are the ones that are too meek and mild to go out into the big wide world. And they tend to become the next professors. So the mechanism itself is a conservative one. History is a conservative discipline in that respect. But remember what Max Planck said, the famous um, physicist. He said that when you bring forward a new idea, it takes it ne- it's necessary for the, the 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 existing academic community to die off before a new idea will be accepted by a new generation of scholars who are not encumbered by the emotional baggage of the previous generation. And I think that's what we're involved we're involved in here. I mean. I come to university uh, out straight out of the rock and roll industry as a mature student. I'm not your 18-year-old school kid who's just come in there, and, is, and I've got some ideas of my own. And when I sit at the foot of my professor's, uh, you know, academic gown, I ask questions, I debate with them, and they love it. They actually love the the because normally they don't get any questions asked asked them by the students. But the problem is those aren't the professors that I have to concern myself with. The ones that know me know what I'm like, know how I think. 
th that's why I was invited to give um, seminars at the postgraduate level when I was an undergraduate student with all the professors there. The ones who don't know me are the problems, the ones who've never met me, who think I'm some sort of charlatan just because you know, a whippersnapper has come along and wants to upset the apple cart. Well, I've got the training. I've done the years and years of training at university and I've got the discipline in me, the academic training to do it. It's much more difficult for them to dismiss me the way that they dismiss other people in this genre of, or, or this idea of creative thinking because a lot of them have not got the background, university background that I've got. So I'm a much more dangerous person for them than somebody that, that, that they can dismiss as saying, oh, well, he's not an Egyptologist, he's not an academic, he's just coming up with these ideas. You know, they can do that with certain figures, but they can't do that with me. And th that's interesting. And before I be able to, to comment, uh, Kevin Stevens, who's a regular listener and one of our original listeners, uh, he said that he met you at uh, uh, a Megalithic Odyssey conference, and just he said that you're oh, a true, yeah. he said that you're a true gentleman. And uh, he's uh, yeah, unfortunately he's left because he lives in your time zone. He's got family things to take care of. But he just right. wanted, he wanted to say hi and said he, he very much appreciated uh, your your talk at that conference. That that was very nice of him to do that. And funnily enough, that was the conference where I did explain what it really is going on with the Sphinx. So let's just put that one down a little marker for later. Because again, <laughs> you know, that's something that I, I am actually in disagreement with Robert Shock about. So you ought to have the op opposite view as well, or an, a different opinion about it anyway, uh, at some point. But yes, I mean, that, that conference was, you know, I'm not a megalithic scholar in the sense I'm a, I'm a history scholar. So when you're going back to the megalithic period or the age of the Sphinx, the pyramids or whatever, that's not my discipline, not my field, as it were. Remember that Egyptology is a very broad field. Of, I mean, you have mummy specialists, you have chronologists, you have historians, you have archaeologists, you have linguist, linguistics, you know, you have people who study text of different periods. So you have epigraphists, you have all sorts of different disciplines within within Egyptology. It's like saying everybody's a surgeon, but there are many different types of surgeon. So, you know, I, my specialism is 32 media per chronology or chronology, but I sometimes dip into this other material because I have some background in training in it. And and my views on the the Giza necropolis and the Sphinx and the, and the pyramids are, are quite different from conventional thinking, but they certainly don't go as far as Robert Shark does. And for the the new chronology, I, I know that you push back the um, this 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 is uh, kind of jumping around the the timetable, and I've got the conventional versus your chronology actually open on yeah. my on my screen here, and I, I've shared okay. it in the chat a little further up. Uh, right. You you push the old di or the pre dynastic uh, period, you know, at least back to thirty two fifty B C, uh, back to yeah. Naka to one and Naka to two and Naka yeah. to three. Uh, yeah. can, can you go into a little bit on, on the, the pre-dynastic times as far as your view? Yeah, I, I can do that. I mean, remember, this is pre-text, so this mm. is pre-history. Um, and the, the definition of history is when texts begin. When you start to have narrative and documentation is when history begins. So anything before writing uh, is prehistory. So Nakada 1 is prehistory, certainly, but Nakada 2 is prehistory. Nakada 3 is where we begin to see writing for the first time in Egypt. Uh, as pr principally things like the records of quantities of particular materials from a particular district of Egypt to a tomb, we might find a docket on a jar that was, you know, was, was contributed to the burial of a king or whatever. And you have what we call serex or Horus names of kings that appear on rocks and various pots and things. And they are the names of the kings who's buried in these tombs or whatever. So we do start to get a record of certain individual rulers at this period. And so we, we can construct a history from around the time of what we call Dynasty Zero, the, which is basically Nakada III. And then, of course, we get the first dynasty when dynastic history truly starts with Menes or whatever, Horus Aha, we think he is. So there are f five or six rulers before Aha who we've got evidence for. Um, the most earliest one we seem to have with a Horus name is Irihor. Uh, he is the successor of King Scorpion of the famous movie. Um, King Scorpion was succeeded, we think, by Irihor. Now, Irihor is the first one, as far as I'm aware, who has a Horus name. So he's the first, first Horus king. And all the kings of Egypt after that were called Horus kings. They were. Horus is the, the symbol of kingship, if you like, the, the falcon god. And, and so it seems to me that he is really the first... Horus king that founds the, the concept of the Horus kings, as it were. And in my personal view, he is the guy who is associated with the construction of the Sphinx because 
Hare Market, the name of the Sphinx, the ha part of that is the word Horus. So Horus, who is in the horizon, is what that means. So it would be logical for the first Horus king to be the creator of the Horus Sphinx, the, the Sphinx of Horus. Uh, and that's what I think you get from the evidence in the Giza Necropolis, because not just the Sphinx itself, but the, there is a series of stone mastabas on the southern side of the Sphinx Causeway, or the causeway going up to the Khafre uh, Pyramid, which are cut into the rock, and they are as heavily eroded as the Sphinx itself. And they had what we call niche facade or palace facade um, decoration on them. Very heavily eroded now, but you can still see remnants of it. And that, we know, is a feature that was invented or created just before the beginning of the first dynasty. So it seems very likely, therefore, that there are some major tombs in the Giza necropolis dating from the beginning of the first dynasty or slightly earlier. And now the erosion pattern on those tombs is exactly the same as the erosion of the Sphinx or the Sphinx enclosure, not so much the Sphinx, which suggests that those sets of monuments, the Sphinx and the tombs, are contemporary about the same date. And, and the erosion that you see on the Sphinx enclosure, where I disagree with Shock fundamentally, is that he wants to now push that back to Gebekli Tepe age, sort of 10,000 BC. And I see absolutely no evidence for that at all. Not only do I not see evidence for it, but the erosion certainly would, could have taken place between, let's say for argument's sake, Dynasty Zero up to the Fifth Dynasty. And at which point the quarrying that took place behind the Sphinx to build the Khufu Pyramid would have deprived water runoff from reaching the Sphinx enclosure because they dug a huge hole in the ground there to the north of the Khafre um, causeway and that if any flash floods were to come down on a regular basis from the top of the plateau and then cascade over the edge of the sphinx enclosure that would have been stopped by the quarrying of the blocks that built p part of the um Khufu pyramid so we could say there's a terminus point where the er erosion stopped ceased at that point the the, the pillowing effect we get uh, on the enclosure and that would be the point where that erosion ceases, and, and the period will be about 450 years. And I think that is certainly sufficient time for that erosion to take place because you've got a huge plateau area there sloping down to the Sphinx enclosure, which every time there's a rainstorm, that would have turned into a waterfall. And I've seen it. When I was a kid, I saw that happen. I actually saw it pouring down the causeway of, of Khafre and into the Sphinx enclosure. Uh, and so I've seen it happen. And you get at least, what today, you get at least one or two heavy rainstorms like that a year in Egypt. In the Neolithic wet phase, which is the time of the pre-dynastic pre era, the time before the fifth dynasty there were, the, egypt was much much wetter there was very very heavy rainstorms going on all the time so you might have got five six seven heavy rainstorms a year cascading over the edge of the enclosure there and causing that erosion pattern it does not take eight thousand years nine thousand years to to do that it really does not it's not required it's one of those things that okay we have you know it'd be a good idea to be able to test this if we've got two or three hundred years to you know, get get some get some uh, sandstone uh, out of Egypt or anywhere, and just cascade yep. water over it for an extended period of time. Well, you, you don't, you, but you don't <clears throat> need to because you've got tombs <clears throat> with niche facade architecture, which we know was invented. We, we, all the evidence points to that being invented at the beginning of the first dynasty, and the erosion patterns on those those monuments are the same as the Sphinx enclosure. Okay. Okay. No, that that makes that makes a lot more sense, and, and thank you very much for clarifying that. Um, with regards to, let's say, uh, trying to date it to Gobekli Tepe, ha have you researched Gobekli Tepe at all? And I know that we've got some people who are interested in it. And yeah. in certain shows, for people who listen to Fade to Black and uh, uh, James Cruz, I'm looking at you, uh, that's an indication for most people to take a shot whenever I, I mention Gobekli Tepe. Right. So, <laughs> what, what... I was actually one of the first ones to visit the place. Really? Um, and I, yeah, and I went up to Gobekli. I can't remember what year it was now. I think it was 2000. And... Was it 2003 or something like that? Something on those lines. Uh, and it, it, it basically, it only just uncovered a couple of the temples at that point. Um, it is a remarkable site. There's no denying it. Um, there are issues, though, with the way people treat that particular site. The, the one thing that um, worries me is they concentrate so much on the temples, 
but they don't concentrate on the plateau. Uh, if you enter the site, um, to your right-hand side, as you go along the path towards where the temple location mm -hmm. is on the top of the hill, to the right-hand side, there's a rock plateau, a sloping plateau that goes down that nobody talks about. And all over that area there, there are holes cut into the rock for standing something or others whether they were stones or wooden beams or whatever they were, and they were clearly alignments for astronomical observation. So that at certain festival points throughout the year, mm -hmm. people would gather there for astronomical events and they would do measuring or whatever. And it seems very clear to me that Gobekli Tepe is uh, it's pre-agriculture. Okay, so it's hunter-gatherer society, but hunter-gatherer society is not just cavemen. It's much more sophisticated than that. And you would have had clans and tribes, and they would have gathered at a place like Gobekli Tepe at certain celestial events like solar eclipses, equinoxes, whatever they might be, spring equinoxes, uh, solstices, or whatever they were. They would observe those. They would, would gather together at that place for spiritual reasons. Because those things were very important to the people in those days. They didn't have color TVs. Their nights were spent gazing at the stars, for goodness sakes. You know, that's what it was all about. Well, if, if you're so, taking some cyclobin, that's as good as, let's say, a good, okay. really, really, really good yeah, color all TV. Right. I, at least from what I've been you know, told. Never done it myself. Yeah. But <laughs> So, so th this site is not a settlement. Okay, there's no burials there. They haven't found human remains as far as I know. It's a gathering place. It's a place for people to gather for rituals on a regular basis, maybe once, twice, three times a year. And they come from their zones of hunting and they would gather together for rituals. <clears throat> what the temple function is, is another matter. They may be astronomical, but they also may be a necropolis. And they may be a places where in that particular region, the process normally for um, for the deceased was not to bury them, was to actually to lay them out to be desiccated by vultures and, and crows and things so that the, the flesh would be picked off the bones and then their bones would be either uh, placed in a, in, a, in a burial somewhere or taken to the home and the skull was quite often placed in the house so that you have ancestors' skulls. Your ancestors were there in your home with you and you would talk to them. And that, that we have lots of evidence for that. So um, it may well be that those shelves that you see in those circular temples were actually for laying out bones or for laying out bodies and then they would come and collect the bones a later date which is why there are no burials there and take them back to their, their ancestral areas where they actually came from so those are the those are the issues i would say that as i would understand it one other point i would mention to you is that because the gebekli tepe monument is a stone because there are no bones there the only way they can get a date radiocarbon date for the remains is to date the soil okay because mm -hmm. soil is li a living organism stone is not they don't have any bones so the radiocarbon dates i under as i understand them are actually soil samples now we know that the the site was reburied okay mm -hmm. it was completely reburied in soil so they're not dating the monuments they're dating the earth and you don't know how old the earth is you don't know where it's come from so get this date of 10,500 BC, or even slightly later, we have to be sure about the dating, and you can't base it purely on soil samples dating, because soil can be much older than the monuments that it, it covers. Now, it, from my understanding, the uh, there may have been, and again, I'm, I, I can't confirm this because I, I don't have the research in front of me, but from what yeah. I have been under, at least from my understanding, is that there, there may have been uh, multiple samples that have been taken, and the uh, consistency for that area is, is the same throughout. So yes, it was it was reburied, and the only way they would have been able to tell that was with multiple samples, unless they just you know drilled one core sample down in one area and took it all from that. No, they don't need to do that. They okay. they simply take they take samples as they excavate, uh, and you, mm -hmm. you you scrape some soil off the top of a one of the stones there, and you go and have, send it away to the laboratory to be to be dated. But it's dating soil, and soil is a natural organism. It's not man-made. Okay, so there's not it doesn't date the stone, it, mm -hmm. the carving of the stone. It doesn't date the people who were there. Okay, it dates the it dates the environment, the locus of the stones, but it doesn't date the stones themselves. Uh, now, with with regards to the carving iron, you, you've seen them firsthand, and uh, I've yeah. only seen them in pictures, and I, I can only imagine how magnificent uh, the, the the monuments would be. 
Um, the idea currently right now, or at least some of the theories that have been presented, is that because it is relief carving, that is somewhat of a um, uh, an advanced carving technique. That very. So, how how long normally has has does it take for for this type of um, uh, technique to arise within within a civilization, at least in your opinion? Well, it's, it, it is extraordinary. That is the one extraordinary thing about Gebekli Tepe, more than anything else, because the carvings are very fine, fine work, exceptional work. And this is pre-metal working. OK, metal mm-hmm. working do, doesn't. If you accept the dates that were the rate of carbon dates, which I've just already said, are maybe dubious. But if you do and you establish these carvings to be 10,000 BC or thereabouts, then you're pre-metal. Okay, now somebody may, might be saying to you, or one of your listeners might be saying, ah, but they must have had metal and they've forgotten how to use it. But we have no evidence of metal. It, nothing's been dug up anywhere. We think they simply used stone. They would used pounders to smooth those big dolmens or whatever you want to call them, those big pillars. But that doesn't explain how they carved the fine art on them. Mm-hmm. And that is the mystery. That is the most important mystery of all of Gobekli Tepe. You know, you would expect those to be made from copper. Copper chisels or copper workings would be the way you would expect that sort of relief work to be done. You can hardly expect it to be done, I don't think, with stone. Unless you've got flint or something like that where you scrape the the actual shapes and things and define the lines with that. And I suppose you've got volcanic stone there as well in that region. So that's another possibility. But that is the extraordinary thing about Gebekli Tebi more than anything else, I think, is the artwork, the art and how they managed to achieve it at that time. But then again, you know, people raise issues about Egyptian art. You know, how did they carve the granite? How did they do this? How did they do that? There's always been this great debate about the technologies of the ancient world and how they achieved them. And, you know, I always say, you know, they, they didn't have a lot of other distractions. You know, they were basically lifters of stone, movers of stone, cutters of stone, movers of dirt, and carvers of stone. That was their big thing. Their technology probably was vastly superior to what we imagine, simply because they didn't have other things. They didn't have the internet. They didn't have computers. They didn't have cars, planes. They were they were good at what they had, which was very little, and they did it very well. As my friends and I say, we just, or at least for Alex and I especially, we just sit around and think up how to do shit. That that's yeah, our usual exactly. our usual line of thinking. Uh, yep. I know that there are certain proponents, especially with uh, the you know old kingdom in Egypt and how there were certain artifacts that were found that were made of some of the hardest stone, and the carvings of them were so uh, so precise and so well balanced yeah. that you can have. A, a bowl that was rounded at the bottom that was made of, let's say, diorite, for instance. And it, it may not be made yeah. of diorite, but just for example's sake. Yeah. And it's a rounded bottom. And all it does is it sits perfectly balanced on that rounded bottom. There's no flat area for it to sit on. And yeah. whether it's full or not. And these are things that we may find difficult to be able to do today. Or maybe we just don't have the need to be able to do it. But who knows how long all the it took time, for... All the time as mm-hmm. well. I mean, the time is the other thing. Just imagine some of these beautiful statues in Egypt of the kings, which are exquisitely done. Now, they are not simply done with a chisel and a hammer. Okay? They, they rough shape them with a chisel and a hammer and the pounders and things. But at the end of the day, they're probably using the, the artists... The, well, well, let's call them, not call them artists. The artisans, the craftsmen who were doing this, and there were many probably working on the same object. They would literally polish and smooth the texture of those stones, those statues, with their thumbs. They would use their skin to smooth and wear down and get the surface the way they did it. They had all the time in the world. One man might spend an entire lifetime creating one statue of a king. You know, that was his job in life. That's what he had to do. And and so we, we can't think of it in the way we do today. I mean, you know, time was not of the essence for them. Okay. Weight and size and all those things didn't matter to them. They just achieved by whatever way they could in the time they had available to do it. And so, you know, they're not in the mad rush that we're in today. We would lose patience immediately, but that, that wasn't a concept to them at all. So, yes, it's it's to do with the skills that they managed to obtain because their minds and their cultures were not cluttered with other rubbish. And how would you look at uh, things like uh, the dating of how long it took the pyramid to be made? I know that there are certain timelines that are set around, like 20 years, yeah. which seems to be the, the accepted 
uh, timeline. Um, yeah. D- d- I, I, even for myself, I, you know, there there are certain theories out there that that they there were uh, pulleys and levers, and that the, it was built from the inside out, or there was uh, water that was involved. Um, yeah. You know, do do you have any idea of how that could have been done, or have you ever hypothesized how that could have been done? Well, let's first of all deal with the time issue, because that's what you raised first of all. Mm-hmm. Now, you're right that uh, the general thinking is that Khufu reigned for 23 years to build the Great Pyramid. Now, it's very true to say that um, you don't you don't have a pyramid that's that started before a king's born, and you don't have a pyramid completed after he's dead, because the next king's busy building his own pyramid. So Khafre or Jedifre, whoever it's going to be the successor, is busy constructing his own pyramid. He's not got time to go and complete his dad's pyramid. So let's forget that idea. The pyramid had to have been built during the lifetime of King Khufu if Khufu was the builder of the pyramid, and that's a different issue entirely. But let's just argue for the sakes of arguments that it is the pyramid of Khufu and he built it. Let's just go with that for the minute. Now, you've got 23 years to do it, and you've got 2.3 million blocks weighing between 2.5 and and 5 tons each on the thing. And if you work out the maths... Uh, you end up having to lay, and even if you're working 24 hours a day with arc lights on the pyramid, which is ridiculous, but even if you were to do that, and you would, you would end up having to lay uh, a, a block every two minutes. You know, and that's just nonsense. That's just impossible. And they, first of all, they only worked in daylight, so you'd have to. You mean it, 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 the dynamics of that construction in that time frame are, are just nonsense. It's not possible. Okay, so then you have to come up with all sorts of ways of thinking of how it could be done. Except there's one very simple explanation. And that is that um, we have documents like the Palermo Stone, which actually recall in the reign of Khufu and other kings what we call cattle counts. Now, cattle counts uh, were done every two years in this period. And what it has, the state goes around and they count all the cattle and they base the taxes on, on the number of cattle in the land at a particular time. This happened every two years. Now, the 23 years that we have for Khufu in the Turin canon may actually be 23 cattle counts, in which case it means that we have 46 years at least for this king, not 23. Ah, okay. Be- okay, and we think it's probably even higher because this, the actual number is dubious as to whether or not that 23 is really there on the document itself. So it might well be that he had a 46 to 50 year reign, in which case... It eases the problem of the building to a limited degree. It still doesn't solve the issue of how on earth they did it. But you could argue then that there's a little bit more time there. They double the time, triple the time perhaps to to build the pyramid as we originally thought. So that's one explanation that would ease the problem a bit. But it doesn't solve it entirely, I have to admit. And you you, uh, are um, at least are... You you know Robert Paval, if I'm not mistaken, is is that correct? Yeah, unfortunately I do. Yeah, he's a good <laughs> friend of mine. Sadly. <laughs> well, I I won't I won't tell him if you won't. But uh, okay. <laughs> there. No, he's great. He's great. He's great actually, but he's a pen in the arse, if I have to say, because he won't stop talking, and I never get a word in edgeways. Well, so uh, whenever I have a whenever I have a Skype call with Robert, he, and I'm trying to write my next book, he's on for about two and a half hours, giving it, you know this all the time giving a you know talking the whole time and i can never get rid of him <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that sounds so if, like if you have him on if you have him on the show i'd, I'd reckon I'd, I'd allow for four or five hours if i were you well you know <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we've gone as, as long as seven hours for an episode so wow. uh, well that, that was uh, that was two episodes ago and we, I th- we started at 8 30 p.m and we went until four o'clock in the morning give or take uh, for all the listeners well, that, out there it's episode that's 22. not gonna happen tonight no I'll tell you i know, that now. I know. <laughs> Uh, but going back to Bavala, I, I know that uh, there is a, a question that is in, in uh, the chat from Silva, and she's asking, um, or uh, he's, again, my eyes are quite bad, so I do apologize, but uh, they're asking about the um, alignment of the Sphinx to Leo and, and, and the correlation yeah. uh, to Orion. And you knowing Baval, is, what what is your opinion on that, and how much have you discussed that between the two of you? Right. I, I have huge respect for Robert. That's the first thing to say. Mm-hmm. And I'm a... I'm a fairly fair conventional Egyptologist. I'm not conventional in terms of the dating, but I mean, I'm trained to be conventional. <clears throat> Robert's um, 
uh, Orion, sorry, Orion alignment thesis or theory, the, the shafts aligning with Orion's belt, etc., is actually a brilliant piece of research, and I think he's absolutely right. I think there's no doubt about that. So his whole idea of the alignment of the pyramids and the sphinx that we has, I accept it 100%, but you must listen very carefully to what Roberts says. He never says, he never says that the pyramids and the sphinx date to 10,500 BC. He never says that. What he says is that the place was created to reflect a time of 10,500 BC, the mm -hmm. Septepi, the first time. In other words, it's, it's imagery that's been recreated for an era when, mythologically speaking, the Egyptians thought creation took place, Septepi, the first time. They're, they're recreating the beginning of time. OK, it does not mean the monuments were done, made at that time at all, except for one important point, And this, I think, is something that isn't really very well known. And that is that if you analyze the the hill or the plateau upon which the three great pyramids are built mm -hmm. at Giza, they have subterranean chambers, all three of them. Yes. Now, those sub those subterranean chambers have passageways, sloping passageways that you enter those subterranean chambers that actually do not come to the outside of the pyramids. They are blocked off, okay, mm -hmm. at the point where the core hill becomes blocks of stone. In other words, they are little mounds of hills made of rock, and the pyramids are built on top of them. And at the very point where those passageways came out of the rock cutting, the blocks then seal them up, and then you get the rest of the pyramid built on either side. That means that the underground chambers under the three pyramids predate the pyramids. Okay? Mm -hmm. So if the pyramids are 4th dynasty, built by Khufu, Khafre, and Menkare, they are built on top of very ancient secret chambers that are aligned with Orion, because the chambers are what's aligned with Orion, not just the apexes of the pyramids. The apexes of the pyramids mark the position of the underground chambers. So the pyramids are actually re-emphasizing three secret chambers or hills that were positioned to align with the um, Orion belt. And that is the key. And those are, in my view, are the secret chambers of Thoth, thrice great. Thoth is thrice great mm -hmm. because there were three secret chambers under Rostau, the place where you enter the underworld, the place of the hidden secrets. And that's what that whole regime is at Giza. And then in the fourth dynasty, they reincarnate it with the monuments. Not the Sphinx, the Sphinx being older, but the three pyramids. And if we're looking at the idea of procession, and I know that we've had individuals yep. on the show who have uh, uh, disputed whether procession is actually from wobble or whether it's from just the movement of, uh, you know, movement of the solar system through space, and that creates it. Uh, how yeah. how do you think they were able to track, and how long did it how long did it take to, to be able to develop that idea of procession and and encode that within those hills uh, at Giza that then became the pyramids? I think it's basically a matter of observation. If 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 Giza, if Giza is an observation platform. If the Sphinx is created not just as the guardian of the necropolis, the Horus on the horizon, but it's also aligned, as Robert argues, to the Leo concept, and that brings you back to 10,500 mm -hmm. BC, they are marking out a plot for calendar observation, and they can observe shifting in the time. So, for instance, the, the Sphinx is aligned uh, to the equinox, okay? So you can actually stand at the Sphinx or behind the Sphinx and you can mark out sunrise on the horizon uh, forward towards the east for the solstices, the furthest points at which they reach and the sun starts to return again before it gets to the next equinox point, etc. And you can mark out what's happened with the agricultural season, the inundation of the land by the by the... Uh, the Nile, uh, you can date the beginning of the new year to the beginning of the flood based on your observations of where the sun rises and in relationship to the position of the Sphinx, which marks due east. So you can plot that line of that movement backwards and forwards of the sun from Giza very, very easily and perfectly. What's interesting is that the season names for the three seasons in Egypt have shifted. So Arket, which is um, supposedly the, the inundation uh, season actually doesn't mean inundation. Shemu means inundation, 
which is the season before. So there's a, been a, there's a, been a shift of alignment between the names of the seasons, which apparently do not reflect the natural world in which the cycles occur. So there is a shift going on, which may we, bear well be an observation that the Egyptians actually made. So they began to understand procession because of the shifting. Now, what about the idea, and even geographically, and I know that this can sometimes be based on which projection of the world map is going to be used. What about yeah. the idea that the pyramids, uh, the, the pyramids of Giza are, are located in, uh, at least, quote-unquote, at the center of all land masses on the map? Is, is there any correlation to this, Ooh. or is this something that is... Uh... I'm not in a position to be able to say about that. You've okay. got this um, a very strange thing about the... The what's it now? I'm trying to remember what it all is. It's to do with uh, Robert's brother, Jean Paul, and the measurements of the meter and the cubits, the royal cubit, and the dimensions of the pyramid, and the fact it sits on a particular number in terms of the longitude and latitude, uh, which is a position where it's something to do with the distance to the pole. And I'm not exactly what sure it is, but some people argue that the, the Great Pyramid is actually in its position for good reasons. It actually gives you the dimensions of the Earth, the circumference of the Earth, because of its position. And it, apparently it's something also to do with the invention of the meter, which I don't really understand, because I, meter for me is a modern concept. But apparently it's it's used within the measurements of the of the Great Pyramid, as well as the Royal Cubit. I'll, 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 so send, it's, I'll send you it's the complex. documentary. Uh, I'll send you the okay, documentary uh, via email if if you'd like. I know I know that it's something yeah. that uh, uh, people within our community generally have known or have have heard about. Um, and I know that the question may have just been related to it just being set, uh, situated within that area. Uh, I've done uh, quite a bit of research and and with researchers like Randall Carlson, whom we've had on yeah. the show several times, uh, have used the the dimensions of the pyramid uh, essentially. And I know Graham has has talked about it as well. Uh, with the dimensions of the Earth, uh, or at least one half of it being encoded within the, the dimensions of the Great Pyramid based on phi and pi, and how that yeah. it could have proved that uh, the ancient Egyptians knew at least the dimensions of the Earth. And several... I think that's what Robert and his brother argue as well. Mm -hmm. I think that is possible within the context. And I don't find that particularly surprising. Uh, I don't think. I mean, you know, okay. They, they were able to measure the circumference of the earth by something or other, whatever mechanism it was they used. And I, I can't see that being a big issue. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean ancient aliens came and give them that knowledge. Um, you know, you have um, Eratosthenes doing exactly the same thing in the early classical period as well, where he, uh, <clears throat> he uh, observed uh, the sunrise at uh, midday, dropping down a well and not creating a shadow and actually had a, a stick at the other end of, of Egypt, uh, a pole, and measured the, the lack of shadow there. And he was able to judge the circumference between Aswan and Alexandria on that basis and therefore calculated within reasonable proximity the dimensions of the Earth. So then it's a possibility, considering that it's been done within ancient times before, maybe later on, that it could have been done. Um, yeah, why not? Why not? I don't see why not. Now, th this is the, the, the part of the show where uh, some guests will revel at it, some guests may cringe, and I'm going to bring up Atlantis. And with oh uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, if whatever you'd like to be able to call it, some you know Atlantis being the uh, ubiquitous term that people will describe to um, the potential for some type of more advanced civilization, may maybe not as advanced as we are today, yeah. and I'm sh certainly not saying they had uh, you know laser fire and crystals or Jetsons uh, cars, which I think would be awesome if they did, but hey, who knows? <laughs> right. Um, right. And this is within within respect to uh, Egyptian history and okay. uh, you know the their, their mythology of, of where Zeptepi came from and and the fact that it their mythology said that you know the the gods had come out of uh, come out of a land that had been destroyed by by water and fire and yeah. they had come from the, from the western lands. How how much have you done research into that yourself? Well, do you, do you have you ever had Andy Collins on your show? Not yet, Andrew no. Collins. Not okay, well, he wrote, he wrote a book called Gateway to Atlantis, and he asked me to write the foreword to that. So I did a bit of research for that book, and uh, it was quite interesting. I'm, I'm of a sort of conservative view on this, but it's, it's, it's not entirely, for me, it's not entirely fictitious. <clears throat> I would say, first of all, that the 10,000 date, the 9,500 BC date or whatever it is, is a bit dubious, um, mainly because I, I see a huge gap in terms of civilization. 
and uh, how you explain how the carryover from a advanced civilization comes and there's this like 4,000, 5,000 year old gap before it starts to pick up again. I have trouble with that. You'd expect some form of continuity of civilization. You know, even if it's destroyed, how does the knowledge pass on to 100 generations later, whatever it is? So it's very difficult to imagine how that would, would work. So I have trouble with the date. Okay, When you take the date out, and you look at Solon's visit to Egypt. Remember, Solon was a great archon of Athens. And he established the laws in Athens. And uh, he knew he was going to get into serious shit once he published the laws. And all the people would be angry with him. Because somebody would always argue about why this law, why that law. So he, he went into voluntary exile. And so he spent years traveling around the, the ancient world. Just enjoying himself like a tourist. And he went to Egypt, of course. And he went to uh, Alexandria and various other places. And uh, not Alexandria, of course, Alexandria didn't exist. He went to Egypt um, and uh, he got this information about Atlantis from the priests, if you remember, in Sais it was. Um, and then that comes into Plato. Plato takes the story from Solon. Uh, now, there is very obviously in that story, there is Athens mentioned as the principal enemy of uh, Atlantis. Now, Athens did not exist in 9000 BC and it was nowhere near the other side of the Atlantic Ocean or in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean there is no reason why there was nothing in Greece at that time nothing at all Mm -hmm. so you have to look for an enemy of of Athens in historical times and of course there was one that was Minoan Crete and there was an island that blew its top and sank into the sea which was Santorini Thera so, and the, the civilizations of Crete, the Minoan civilization, and the Athenians were at war. They were in conflict with each other. And so, there are a lot of parallels between the stories of the destruction of Santorini Thera and the Atlantis destruction. And Athens comes into the picture. So, there is a lot of historians who say that this is borrowed from that particular story. Remember that the the whole story that it's been told is one of moral teaching. It's not so much historical. It's supposed to be teaching about morals, about what happens to civilizations that collapse. You know, the, the, you know, the type of civilization it became. That's what the moral teaching is. And it's teaching it to Athen- Athenian democracy. The people say, don't let it go this way. The way it went with Atlantis is a moral code. But there are other elements to this story, aren't there? Like the pillars of Hercules, for instance. Now, the pillar, if Atlantis lay beyond the pillars of Hercules, that's an entirely different story now because it can't be the Santorini story, the Thera story. So there may be two elements to this story that have been brought together to create the Atlantis myth. So the pillars of Hercules, where are those? Well, people argue that it's the Gibraltar Straits. In fact, that isn't the reality. It's quite clear from the classical writings that it's not there. The pillars of Hercules or Heracles were two bronze pillars that were built on Sancti Petri Island just near Cadiz today, which was an ancient city, a Phoenician city. And whenever you sailed past the temple of of Hercules there and you saw the two bronze pillars, you were going beyond the pillars of Hercules. That's what the thing was. So if you ventured either northwards up to Britain or you went across the Atlantic, Mm -hmm. you would pass the pillars of Hercules. So if we're looking for that, then we're now looking beyond the Atlantic Ocean. We're looking to the Sargassan Sea over there, the the Sea of Weeds, as it were. Mm -hmm. And you're looking at the Caribbean. So there is a possibility that there are two stories here that have been amalgamated and that perhaps there was some megalithic culture, which is represented by the fact that many of the megalithic sites face the Atlantic or are on the Atlantic seaboard and that there was something in the megalithic period that was going on outside on the other side of the Atlantic around Cuba area or something like that. In fact, Andrew Collins argued that Cuba is actually a sunken island. Uh, that what we see today is actually the mountains, and that the rest of the of the air of the original island south of Cuba was originally the plain of Atlantis. That's his argument, and it has some merit, I have to say. I'm not talking about the Bimini stuff now. That's, don't think that's relevant to this. So there may be some memory of something like that, and we do have evidence of Atlantic, the Atlantic Ocean being crossed. In historical times, mm-hmm. in ancient times, we have um, we have a Carthaginian shipwreck, for instance, off the coast of Brazil, where Carthaginian amphorae were found inside it, which means that at least traveling travelers were crossing the Atlantic in the time of Carthage. 
uh, when Carthage was at its peak, uh, we have Roman terracottas in Mexico. So it's quite clear that people were traveling the Atlantic in ancient times. Now, whether you can go back to megalithic period is another issue, but I'm open-minded to it. Now, Randall Carlson, again, you, you may have heard the the name at uh, at one at one point or another. He's worked with Graham Hancock on on uh, Magicians yeah. of the Gods, and I'm getting uh, bombarded by questions regarding this. So I'm going to try and, and combine this into one for for everyone who's listening at home. Uh, okay. the, the, one of the main theories that um, Magicians of the Gods brings brings forward, and this is based on the research of Randall Carlson. Um, uh, and that is of a, uh, a comet impact in North America uh, around the age of 10,500 BC. Um, with the middle of the, or the Atlantic plate ending in the middle of the Atlantic, and all of this ice pressing down on the uh, North American plate, uh, there is something called isostasy, which essentially the edges of the North American plate pushed up above the water. Uh, in combined with the much lower water uh, levels, because every all, all the water had been uh, trapped within that that glacier or the two glaciers on the North American plate, and mm-hmm. that at least they're saying is a possibility of proving the, you know, it, at least it's again it being a theory that there sh- may have been a landmass at one time in the Atlantic if that had happened, and apparently. Mm-hmm the conditions for during the Ice Age would have made it quite habitable in the middle of the Atlantic. And, and that is right. the main theory that is being uh, brought forward. And I'm not sure if, if you have uh, listened to or, or uh, either listened to the uh, Audible book, Magicians of the Gods, or, or read Graham's work yourself. But what... I haven't read that particular book. I have read some of his earlier works. But he said, oh, that's a geolo- geologist question. You mm-hmm. need to ask a geologist on this stuff. Uh, it's something that, I mean, I'm not anti-catastrophism oh, by okay. any stretch of the imagination. But I, I, you know, I would like to know, I'd like to know stuff like, where is this strike? Where was the strike in the North American continent? Where did it happen? Well, there are a couple things. Where's the evidence for it? Well, there there are a couple theories. Uh, there are some strikes or, or some impact zones around uh, Lake Ontario and uh, actually near where my, my in-laws uh, run an antique shop um, yep. that could have been dated back to that area. There is also the theory that uh, it, it, the ice uh, sheet took the brunt of it, and that's why there are not very many craters. There are only splash points. Uh, the Carolina Bays being some of the um, uh, the other uh, kind of shrapnel hit points from, from that comet impact. And, right. uh, you know, the, the idea is that if there it was some civilization that had existed in the middle of the Atlantic and it did have, um, uh, you know, worldwide reach at that point, then that's a possibility of the original source for it. Now, uh, again, I don't know for sure. And I'm, I'm, you know, you and I haven't lived that long. Uh, no. You know, uh, it's it, I, I've lived quite a while, actually, to be honest. I'm a crusty old historian <laughs> and I, a crusty old historian would require evidence. So what Understood. I would ask immediately would be, let's find or present to me archaeological evidence. You can't argue that the entire civilization is buried under the fault lines of the of the Atlantic. There has to be some peripheral materials. A civilization mm-hmm. that was at the center and the heart of the Atlantic must have had peripheral activities on the American continent and the European African continents. And I would want to see specific evidence that would not only show an advanced culture, but also would be dateable, scientifically dateable as well. And I'm not a big follower of radiocarbon dating for its accuracy, but when you're talking about thousands of years, then it is reasonably accurate. When it's not very good, when it comes down to 50 years or something like that. Mm-hmm. So you, you, would, you would have to produce for me something other than the theory and, the, and what I would be looking for, and, and then with any theory, any scientific theory or any historical theory, you propose a theory, and then it's tested by other people, and they you produce you produce some sort of prophecy as to what will be found to confirm your theory, and then people will go and look for it. So I would like to know what evidence do we have, archaeologically speaking, for an advanced culture in the middle of the Atlantic, which has periphery outliers. On the continents that exist today, that's what. I'm, if you're going to turn around and say the pyramids, then, <laughs> you know, then then I've, I've wasted my time today. No, no, and and that's uh, that's not uh, not it at all. I know that there are uh, locations like well, uh, again, uh, Gobekli Tepe would be one at least one, uh, one potential um, 
piece of evidence that is there based around that, but I know we've discussed it at length. Places look like where, look where Gebekli Tepe is located. Oh, I, I, I'm aware. That's why it's like, well, you know, for for myself, it's the back of beyond. It's nowhere. It's in the middle <laughs> of nowhere. You know, it's not. It's not even close to any of the great civilizations of the ancient mm-hmm. world. Mesopotamia is a ways off, and Anatolia is a ways off, and it's sitting on a hill in the middle of nowhere in the north, sorry, southeast uh, Turkey today, and 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 it's quite clearly a hunter gatherer location it's it's not it's primitive apart from the carving okay it's nothing special so what is this civilization we're talking about you know that it it's much more akin to what you see in minoan culture where you do have a sophisticated civilization Mm -hmm. in that case which was destroyed and wiped out so you, you've got to, you've got to, buy, and there we do have archaeological and historical evidence. What I'd say is, where's the matching evidence for 10,000 BC along the 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 shorelines of the Atlantic Ocean? Well, again, the, it, it's also the line of questioning is to try and maybe pique your interest so that maybe you could make a TV special about it further on down the line if you'd like to. Oh, I'm too much of an old skeptic <laughs> to do that. So you'd have to get, you'll have to get somebody else to do that sort of thing. <clears throat> Well, anyway, I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm far too old to be doing TV now. Well, I, either way, it's. I, I know that you. Uh, and going going on into into our final uh, 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 into our final segment of the day, I know that you sure. do have a new special that we talked about uh, earlier on. Um, did Did you want to go a little bit more into that for the listeners at home? For the what? Sorry, what's what part of it? Oh, for, uh, to uh, the new special that you have uh, that that's being that's been produced that that's going to be released soon. Oh, you mean the film? Yes. Oh right. Okay. Well, it's it's an ongoing project. I mean, you've you've got the original Patterns of Evidence movie, which mm-hmm. you, which you've watched, and it's about two hours long. And you can imagine they had they had something like nine hundred hours of footage, something ridiculous like that that they filmed over the period because it took um, Tim Mahoney about ten years to make that movie, the director. And um, so he's got lots of footage. In fact, the biggest problem is that um, technology has moved on and some of the footage he's got now is not HD anymore, so he can't use it. So he's got this dilemma to having to recreate the stuff that he filmed, you know, in 2003 or whatever that uh, he can't put into his movies now. But anyway, we're we're off to Israel in, um, in what is it now, June, May, May? I think it's May we're going. And uh, we're going to be filming more material there that moves us on into the conquest era and Joshua, and then it, eventually into the United Monarchy period of David and, so- and Solomon and Saul as well. So we'll be filming all that material over the month of, of May. Um, and then he's going to be editing all this. So there is a lot of things going on. But what he intends to do, as far as I understand it, is that he's going to, first of all, turn the original movie the two hour movie with the extra footage he's got and the footage we're going to film in in israel in the summer he's going to turn that into a 12-part tv series so those people who missed the film when it came out on the circuit the documentary movie or have not got the dvds will be able to watch a 12-part series version of it on tv somewhere i'm not sure he's got the broadcaster sorted out yet and then um, he's moving on. The plan is to move on and to deal with the United Monarchy period and the divided monarchy period. So we're moving all the way through biblical history and trying to equate the archaeology that we find in the Holy Land, in Palestine, Syria and Israel with the Egyptian evidence based on the new timeline of the new chronology. That's the whole idea of it, to show that it's not just the Exodus and Conquest that work very well, but in the entire history of Israel works well with Egyptian history. Because one of the great issues that's been raised always in my material is oh well it might work for the exodus and it, I might, oh it might work for the conquest but what about the united monarchy what about the judges period you can't make that work surely so they're all sort of saying oh you've got to you know you've got to prove your entire case well i'm quite happy to do that and you're like no here problem. hold my beer i'll do that <laughs> yeah no, that's no trouble at all i mean I, you know they haven't read my books so they don't know i've already done it so I'm, i'll just surprise them oh there you well, go once you, the thing is the media you know people find it easier to watch a film or to watch a tv show than they do read a book so you know you you find although you've written books and some of them have been bestsellers not everybody knows about them and and generations you know die off and new generations come along who've never seen pharaohs and kings and don't know what it's about and never heard of me not surprisingly so they've got to be reintroduced to this material so it we have to adapt to the circumstances of the new media and this thing has to be made into tv and film and and it will be and whether i survive the whole exercise another matter you know i don't know how long it's going to take well, I, I'm sure a uh, r- robust man like yourself with uh, a very, very fantastic uh, uh, Manchester accent, I'm sure you'll do fine. 
It's okay. Fun. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, you know, we, we've been at this for about two and a half hours, and I know this has yeah. been one of the most uh, uh, information-packed shows we've done uh, in quite some time, and it's it's been a – Egypt is a very big passion of mine as far as history yeah, it sounds it's, It sounds like I've worn you out. Oh, is no. I the, the truth of the matter? <laughs> well, no, I, I know that you, you wanted to uh, – I know that it's late there. It's almost about 1030, so I want to make sure you'd have some time before you head to bed, and I didn't want to keep yeah. you too late. Absolutely, cocoa and a hot water bottle. Absolutely, that's what I need now. No, and I'm, I've got my wife is just uh, arriving at home, so we're we're gonna have to get supper ready. It's about four thirty p.m. Right. Eastern Standard Time. Okay. But Good. Uh, but David, I I greatly appreciate you coming on to the show and uh, giving us this. Oh, it's been fun. It's been great fun. I've enjoyed it. Well, you know, fantastic. And I, I know that there are some people who are, are have been stating over and over again that uh, I have to get you, Graham Hancock, and Randall Carlson onto one show. And I don't know how much scotch that would uh, cost me to be able to do that, but Ooh. if if I can organize that at some point, I'm sure that the listeners at home would appreciate it. So um, right. you, you never know. You may get a phone call or a text message or an email at some point with, uh, with an invitation back for that. But um, other than that, you are a friend of the Den of Lore. If you ever do want to come back on the show, just shoot me an email. You are always more than welcome. And uh, again, I'm getting tons of thanks from from the listeners at home for for your time and uh, and your efforts. So I uh, am going to do what we normally do here at uh, the Den of Lore, and I'm going to play our outro music for you, which is uh, basically our way to serenade you to uh, to the uh, land of sleep and uh, evenings in where, where you are. <laughs> One moment. Thank you, thank you very much. Good night to everybody there. Good night. And this is uh, from Broke for Free, Spellbound. Uh, and uh, that was uh, David Roll, uh, Egyptologist and uh, one of the world's top uh, historians uh, who joined us on for episode uh, 24. Uh, again, thank you all for joining us at home. Uh, Kevin, uh, I hope you enjoyed the download of the episode. And uh, next week, uh, we are going to be having uh, Edward Nightingale back on the show to talk the Giza plan uh, with regards to the Golden Ratio. And I'm, uh, you know, we, we had him on for about an hour, uh, David, uh, for episode 22. And for like that hour, it was just, it was just uh, pure mathematics and design, which, uh, which I'm sure you may love. So I'll send you a link to that if you want to come check it out. Uh, you know, for everyone at home, this is uh, Chris George Zuger signing off. And uh, again, we'll see you next week, Friday at 8.30 p.m. our regular time. And we'll, we'll share another glass of Glen in the den. <laughs>